and reduce the losses. Also, it will create a relationship between the supplier and the farmers. It will be a very strong relationship because they are connected by different means of the agriculture. For the technology companies, uh, this will offer them new opportunities using proven models that increase the readiness. It will increase the adoption of the technologies because they will be aware they have the information and this will increase the adoption process. Ability to reach new customers. Also, e-agriculture will let them to reach everyone in a remote areas because they will be sent on the internet or through mobile the message and this will reach everyone everywhere. It also have an opportunity to achieve business and social benefit by increasing access to technology. And when uh, all farmers have access to technology, they can adopt it and then they can purchase, the, uh, purchase these uh, inputs from the business or from the technological companies. And this is, will lead to their business benefits. For the universities and extension office, it will create direct access to unreachable farmers. For the conventional extension for the researchers, they cannot reach every farmer everywhere. This will let them to reach unreachable farmer in the remote area, in the rural areas. It also provides ability for testing and validating academic research. We conduct, as academician, we conduct research in the laboratory and we have in the field, and then how to put this in the real field. And this is, will be zero e agriculture. Also, it will provide opportunities for solving technical problems and share best practices with the aggregate group of farmers. We share our best practices as academician in the university or extension agents that transfer the knowledge from the research to the farmers it will provide them with this opportunity it enhances students in handout projects they work uh, practical work they have uh, to do practical work for the agricultural students particularly uh, here I, I i will show some of the e-agricultural themes there are many themes they are multidisciplinary it is have uh, in fao there are more than 1,000 themes in e-agriculture. Here, this, this is just an example from FAO 2020 for data and information. For example, we have early warning system, GIS, for farming crops, how to improve farm, how to detect the water requirement and the moisture content of the soil. There are drones and also for livestock to, uh, to check the pasture and vitrine to provide these veterinary services. For the extension, they have distance learning and extension for using the technologies. For climate change, there are many mitigation and adaptation which will be provided to the farmers and resilience. Also for agricultural value chain, there is mobile finance and finance payment, market information. Market information are very important, particular price, uh, food price, uh, prices of inputs, this will help uh, the farmers and will increase the productivity. This is just an example of the themes of the, of the e-agriculture which are currently available. Also, uh, there are good practices and promising practices. Uh, a good practice is a practice that is not only good, but it also works well and produces good results in different setting or context and recommended as a model. This is as defined by the FAO. It has a successful experience, has been tested, validated in broad sense, and they can be and they are deserved to be adopted by a great number of people. And this is according to the FAO. This is a good practices. The practice which was successful, validated and tested and adopted by many people this is will will call good practices. While promising practices is the practices that has the high degree of success. 
and there is a possibility of replication in the same setting. And it generates some quantitative data and positive outcome. It has a positive outcome, it has a quantitative data, but it hasn't been replicated. And there is a possibility for to be adopted by other, by other farmers. And when it is adopted at up scale, it will uh, be transferred to the good practices. These are practices in agriculture. Uh, for the success stories, uh, we have here three examples for good practices. The Digital Green Participatory Video Project, Vane, Vine Komar, uh, the SMS Gateway for Improving Animal Health through Information and Communication Technology, eLocust as an innovative tool for crop-based control system. Uh, these are three uh, samples of the good, good practices to be adopted, and they have been adopted in many countries. Uh, I will, I will uh, have only the Paris one from the good practices, and we will take also one of the promising practices due to the time limitation. Uh, good practice, Digital Green. Uh, the founder of Digital Green is Vine Komar. Uh, he used testing the use of participatory video as the mean of agricultural registration in India. He used uh, this video, creating short video that captures scientific and locally relevant best practices, the best practices in each area to be disseminated among the local community. He, he creates videos that is take the scientific part and the local part with the local language to be understandable to each one of them. He founded that on the belief that technology can accelerate effort to end poverty. And they have very clear link between poverty and food security status because uh, poverty will lead to food insecurity. And when you improve the status of uh, productivity and income, this is will let them to be food secure and automatically to be above the poverty line. The impact of this uh, digital green, it improves small farmer productivity. It is very effective compared to the traditional, the traditional agricultural registration program to visit a certain area, to sit with them, to give them advice and to send the message in a brochure or something like this. This is a very effective cost wise it is more, almost 10 times more efficient than the traditional one. High coverages and good targeting. It will not only target the, uh, the large size farmers, it will target everyone, even the farmer with a minor, with a very small holding and with very low productivity, he can uh, have these digital uh, green uh, videos and can adopt the technology and improve his productivity. Also, 90% of the viewers of the video are women. Women play a very significant role in, uh, in rural agriculture in general in the world, particularly in the developing countries. Relevant videos in, in 15 language and is screened offline in communities. It also have a possibility to show this in offline communities that have limited electricity and internet connectivity, and they uh, abbreviated in connect offline, connect online. The average rate of adoption is uh, six out of 10. Each 10 uh, good practices, six of them will be adopted by the producers. The global impact used 1.5 million video screening. 80% of beneficiaries are women. Uh, 16,000 frontline workers were trained and compact malnutrition through agro nutrition gardens. This is very important for the rural area. Digital Green has implemented projects in nine states in India and also in 15 countries like Ethiopia, Afghanistan, and many other countries. 
For the promising practices, we have AgroWeather tool for climate smart agriculture, a voucher for increasing the use of improved agricultural inputs, and SMS campaign drive adoption of improved seed varieties in Tanzania. Also, I will talk on available on all these all these good practices and promising practices are available accessible in the internet for the agro weather tool which is developed by kenyan agricultural and livestock research organizations uh, the founder is uh, dr akoko the justification is that the farmers in kenya depend on the traditional method for weather prediction and this is will not lend to mitigate to the risk of, uh, brought by, by climate change. And also farmers adopt their agricultural practices. They adopt agricultural practice based on the previous experience. So extension is very important. Information are very important for them to improve their productivity. AgroWeather tool, it is a web and mobile-based information system that is incorporate climate information and agricultural practice to farmers. It will provide the farmers the tool to follow to better manage the weather risk, maximize the productivity, and maximize the environmental impact of the farming practices. These are the benefits there are many stakeholders who are uh, share this agro weather tool for climate smart agriculture. Uh, Kenyan Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization provide processed climate information. This from the this institute. Meteorological professional provide weather information and climate data. Agricultural research scientists provide research data agronomic information and agricultural research knowledge. There are many stakeholders. Also, there are two, two data scientists, a manager, and ICT professional, which are expert in uh, system development, database, architecture, and design, and also in data mining and modeling. All the five stakeholders, they have an input and contribution to the Agro weather tool for climate smart agriculture. This is uh, this uh, this is the development of this uh, tool. Those data set and data information received from the meteorological system feed into agro weather tool. The tool generates location specific information. It generates information to specific location on the forca and forecasted information and data. There are many data will be forecasted based on a certain uh, situation. Researchers use this process information to generate advisories. From reading this information and interpreting this information, and then this advisory will be disseminated to the farmer via SMS technology. There is no need to have meet them directly, uh, with the, which is very expensive and also via web-based portal and interactive voice response. Or well, these are three methods used to provide the advisory to the farmers. The impact of this agroclimate, the difference between the productivity of beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, it is almost five times. The beneficiaries produce five times compared to non-beneficiaries of this agro weather tool. The income of the beneficiaries is almost three times of those who, who, who are not using this tool. Pharma were able to plan better and to take decision on the level of agricultural production. At the different level of agricultural production, they can take a right decision because they have the right information and the right advices. Farmer maximize productivity and minimize the environmental impact based on this information provided to them. Uh, AgroWeather is a useful in making complementing recommendations about which agricultural innovation and management practice to use. 
this is will let them which the suitable agri innovation which is the suitable agricultural practices they can use and also help the extension uh, in delivering their uh, their information in delivering the advice to the farmers and also the new technology and innovation will increase the adoption rate for these new technologies because the farmers are aware and updated with the information. The future prospects of e-agriculture for the food system, food system for production, processing, all of them will be affected by the e-agriculture because there will be a good information to everyone for the, for the agro-processor, for the distribution, transportation, for the consumption. And this will automatically affect the food security pillars of accessibility. For example, if increase the productivity, this is increase the production, and hence it will affect the availability pillar of the food security. If the food prices are aware, the farmer will have a high price from his uh, product, and this will affect also his income and affect his accessibility, and so on. Uh, the future also prospect, they are in uh, agricultural resources in Arab countries. In Arab countries, there is the food gaps, and this is food gaps, although they are country have a potential of resources, but they, have, they produce with very low productivity because they didn't adopt the improved technology and they didn't benefit from the role of sense in enhancing food security. So uh, when this e-agriculture is applied, it will improve the production and hence it will reduce the gap in a food gap in Arab countries. For example, in Arab countries, the food gap is about uh, 35 billion in 2018. Uh, 2018. 66% are cereal, five are meat, and nine are milk and milk products. It also leads to reduce the food gap in Arab countries through utilizing efficient utilization of the available resources and adoption of improved technology and good and promising practices which benefit for improving the production and adopting the mitigation. Lastly, let me uh, share with you that now we are working on a book about uh, food and nutrition security in KSA, which is uh, have two volumes accepted for publication by Springer. One volume one is about the national analysis of agricultural food security and the second is about macroeconomic implication on food and nutrition security accepted by Springer. And we have a chance uh, till now for co-authors. And uh, if there is anyone interested uh, to share us how to contribute a chapter to this book, he is welcome. And also in the King Faisal University, they adopt identity for the university, which is food security and environmental sustainability. And, and this is also can provide the room for further cooperation with the relevant institution in the, between the universities. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Adam El Haag Ahmed from Saudi Arabia, for your nice presentation. Now I am requesting to Dr. Brucey Johnson. He is graduate in chemistry and pure mathematics from University of Sydney, Australia. He served in professional musician in Sydney. Recently he is working as homotherapy volunteer teacher consultant in India and established with any gold free Tapuvan Homa organic farm in Jalgaon, Maharashtra state of India. He is actively engaged in homo therapy since 1987 in Australia as well as in our India. Now I am requesting to Dr. Brucey Johnson for his kind presentation on homo organic farming for 
global food security. Dr. Bruce Johnson. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here in your uh, uh, international virtual conference. It's a great initiative. I think the chancellors of uh, Sri Krishna University and uh, organizers, uh, especially Dr. Ashwani Kumar De uh, Dubey, who invited me for this uh, particular conference. Um, I want to share my screen now. Can you activate the screen sharing, please? Okay. So, uh, my particular subject today is home organic farming. Home organic farming for global food security. Now, when we talk about food security, we have to consider the problems with agriculture worldwide now. These problems can be traced back to one serious mistake in agriculture generally. And that is intensive chemical based agriculture is not sustainable. With chemical fertilizers and pesticides, it becomes necessary to increase the dosage or alter formulas as the years go by, more and more inputs are required to produce the same results as before. Farmers spend more on external inputs while their income is dropping. Nutrients are extracted from the soil without replenishing them, thus robbing the soil of its life sustaining elements. Then insects are become a huge problem. They adapt to the chemical poisons and many crops are attacked ferociously. After the Chernobyl nuclear accident in Russia, the insects did not die out. They mutated into new unknown forms, which are totally resistant to all chemical poisons. Wrong agricultural practices and wholesale destruction of forests have affected the weather patterns. Rains are no longer reliable or regular and cause great destruction. All rains now are acidic. Soil becomes acidic, so much so that in some places nothing will grow. And the hybrid seeds, which gave uh, such excellent results in the 1960s and 70s, no longer yield those good results. A stage comes in farming when nothing grows unless the farmer uses massive doses of fertilizers and pesticides. At this stage, he is ruining his soil, his subsoil and the water resources. The final stage is reached when the farmer plants the seed, waters the field and waits, but nothing happens. Nothing will grow, not even weeds. Land that was once fertile and produced abundant crops has to be abandoned. The soil has been totally destroyed. Scientists now say that all rain that falls is acid rain. They also say that the oceans are turning acidic and therefore the soil is also a turning acidic. Acid rain not only affects the natural ecology, but the people and the agricultural crops as well. In fact, acid rain is destroying the top 15 centimeters of soil on our planet on which all of life depends. The soil depth and its richness are a basic standard of health of the living planet. When soil is lost, imbalance and injury to the planet's life occurs. Soil scientists estimate that 300 to 1000 years are required for the buildup of each one inch of topsoil. Civilization which depends on this topsoil for its survival is destroying that topsoil. 
this is ultimately a suicidal act. And then we have the problem of radioactivity. Nuclear radiation causes immediate death, burns, cancers, birth defects, mutations, and many other maladies. There is no acceptable method for the disposal of the waste. Then the nuclear accidents such as Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, nuclear wars waged over the last 20 years with depleted uranium. And then there's also natural radiation which comes from the bowels of the earth. Global warming is another factor. Man-made increase of CO2 in our atmosphere. The other sources of warming are methane, chlorofluorocarbons, oxides of nitrogen and low elevation ozone. If warming continues at the current rate, scientists predict a planetary extinction event. event. Then GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Chemical pollution we know is one thing, but no matter how bad that chemical pollution, it will gradually reduce over time. Even nuclear radio radioactive poisons will slowly mutate into their non-radioactive forms. But GMOs, genetically modified organisms, are biological pollution. And this contamination will only increase over time. There are many studies which show that genetically modified organisms are much more aggressive and will eventually wipe out the natural organism from its habitat. Then there was a report which came out in the year 2008 after four years of research by a team of 400 scientists, their conclusion was, in terms of agriculture, small scale organic farms are the future. Indigenous and local knowledge plays just an imp as important a role as formal science. Business as usual is now not an option. GMO crops are a big disaster. Chemical agriculture is a major cause of global warming. These were the main conclusions of that report. So it seems like organic farming, everything seems to be pointing now towards organic farming as a, a solution. Benefits of organic farming come in the form of energy savings, decreases in the amount of greenhouse gases and global warming, water savings, globalization problems are avoided, pesticides are reduced, environmental impact is much less, nutrition and health are increased, seed saving is there, job protection and sustainability. But now due to this unprecedented attack by these hybrid and compound forms of pollution, some Western scientists think that we may have reached the stage which may be termed irreversible. Organic methods of farming, which used to give wonderful results in the past, now fail to do that due to this pollution. The solution to this lies in the super technology of Vruksha Ayurveda, which is now presented to the modern world as homo-organic farming. Now, about homo-organic farming, when we see farmers making the tra tradition from chemical farming to organic farming, there are generally several difficulties which crop up. First is lower yields compared with conventional chemical agriculture. Then the appearance and the size of the produce does not normally meet commercial standards. And there is an increase generally in insect pests and diseases. Low yields are the most difficult obstacle to overcome. So speaking on the subject of low yields, I just wanted to uh, tell you this particular story from uh, one of our Homa farmers. This particular guy, his name is Sri Ramesh Chandra Tiwari. He's from Unnao district in UP. And in the 2010 season, he achieved a record production of mangoes, 120 tons in three hectares. That's 40 tons per hectare. Now, if anybody knows about mangoes, you'll know that that figure is not possible. The farmers in that area averaging around 10 tons per hectare. With all known techniques and using agrochemicals, the 
10 tons per hectare can be extended up to maybe 14 or 15 tons per hectare. But this particular guy in 2010, using the techniques of homo organic farming, achieved 40 tons per hectare of mangoes. It's just unbelievable. So there's no question that this homo organic farming method can definitely solve the problem of low yields in organics. In fact, with homo organic farming, the quantity of harvest per acre will be greater than that grown by any other method. Harvesting time is reduced. The taste of the homo produce is better. There is improvement in color and texture of the harvest. The homo produce has a longer shelf life than that grown by any other method. Natural predators appear automatically. Disease resistance increases and the cost of production is much less compared with other methods. So when I say homo organic farming, what exactly is this? What does it mean? Homo organic farming means the application of the principles of homotherapy to organic farming practices. And what is homotherapy? Homotherapy means healing and purifying the atmosphere, soil and the water resources with fire as the medium. The central idea in homotherapy is you heal the atmosphere and the healed atmosphere heals you. And of all the fire practices given in the ancient science, the ancient Vedic science of homotherapy, Agnihotra is the basic homa. Now, Agnihotra, when we say Agnihotra, we mean one very specific haban, very specific homa. It's practiced in that small copper vessel, pyramid shaped of a, a specific exact shape and size. Has to be exactly that shape and size. Ingredients to be burnt in this fire are the dried cow dung cakes, pure cow's ghee, and unbroken, unpolished grains of rice. Then there is a simple Sanskrit mantra to be uttered. And important, most important is the timing of this Agnihotra, two times in a day, exactly at the timings of sunrise and sunset, exact to the second. So to practice this Agnihotra, you uh, prepare the fire, the fire should be fully ablaze at the time given in the timetable of sunrise or sunset. Take a few grains of rice and apply a little ghee, little cow's ghee, it has to be pure cow's ghee only. Divide into two portions. And then there are two ahutis, two offerings. After each of the words swaha in the mantra, you offer one portion of the rice ghee mixture to the fire. Here is the Agnihotra Mantra at sunrise. Suryaya Swaha, Suryaya Idanamama, Prajapataye Swaha, Prajapataye Idanamama. And at sunset, Agnaye Swaha, Agnaye Idanamama, Prajapataye Swaha, Prajapataye Idanamama. Now, when we start homo farming, what we do is we establish what we call a resonance point. In a resonance point, 10 new Agnihotra pyramids are required, which are activated with mantras, and they're placed in the farm in a special configuration. Two simple huts are required also with natural inexpensive local materials. The same human effort is required for a one acre farm or for 200 acres. So one resonance point can treat up to 200 acres at a time. The farmer simply has to do Agnihotra daily at sunrise and sunset and then a few hours of another homa which we call Om Trambakam Homa. I can't go into details about that now because of the time limitations. Then normally uh, for homo farming, cooperation is necessary between the farmers. So here's an example of 
24 small farms, which are all cooperating together. They're all organic and they're all participating in the Agnihotra and the Homa to uh, treat their combined farms, which uh, come up to an area of 150 acres in this particular case. Now, the, the cow is a very important uh, factor in the uh, homo organic farming. Cow dung and cow's gear are absolutely essential items for all the homo fires. Cow dung and cow urine also used for treating the seeds before planting. And uh, the cow dung and cow urine are also necessary components for our biofertilizers, such as homo biosol. Then when we talk about cows and cattle, there was one study which was done, informal study in Peru, in South America, over a period of 18 months, where the health of cattle was studied on farms where homotherapy is practiced and also on conventional farms without the homotherapy. And you can see from the table there that the various parameters which were tested were all improved with the homotherapy. What is very interesting is the second from the bottom point uh, parameter is the placenta retention. Now, re retention of the placenta is a difficult problem in uh, animal husbandry of uh, cows, but you'll notice that with the homotherapy, they found that there was absolutely no placenta retention whatsoever. So this is a very, very important factor when it comes to cattle health. Honeybees are also extremely important for all of agriculture. Honeybees are now dying on a mass scale in all parts of the world. Not enough nutrition. Because bees are needed for balance on the planet. And uh, so this is a big threat to agricultural production. Interestingly enough, in the ancient science of uh, Vedas, it's told that inborn in the honeybee are certain hormones that are produced only in what we call homa atmosphere. That's an atmosphere which is created by this agnihotra and homotherapy in the agriculture. This subject is completely foreign to anything that Western science has encountered so far. And these hormones that are uh, developed in the honeybee by this agnihotra are very important for increasing the nutritional levels in fruits and vegetables. Now, I have some figures here of some studies which have been done to show what are the improvements in yield and uh, uh, disease incidence in various uh, crops. Uh, there's uh, just a sample of uh, some of the studies which have been done. First one is from our good friend, Dr. Selvaraj from uh, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University in Uti. And you can see in this particular case, this was uh, cabbage and the uh, they were testing the incidence of leaf spot disease on the cabbage. You can see from the figures that uh, the, the red one is the uh, organic treatment plus Agnihotra. And uh, that uh, particular uh, parameter showed the lowest in terms of incidence of disease and also the highest in terms of yield. Then was another study on potato by the same a group of scientists in Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. And in this particular place, uh, per study, they were uh, studying late blight, percentage of late blight. And you'll see uh, 90 days after planting, the incidence was much less with the Agnihotra plus organic, and the yield was also greater. And then here's another study. This time, this is from the CSK Himachal Pradesh Agriculture University in Palampur, in Himachal. Study by Dr. Rameshwar, Dr. Poonam, and Dr. Atul. 
And this study was on the uh, yield and quality of lemongrass where when using Agnihotra ash combined with organics. And again, you can see here, I've highlighted in red where the Agnihotra ash was used. We got the best results of all the parameters which were tested. So this is general uh, situation with uh, all of the studies we've, uh, ha and there are now quite a sizable amount of studies which have been done on uh, homo organic farming. They also all show much greater improvement in all the parameters than as compared to uh, other organic methods and also conventional agrochemical methods. Then it was an interesting study which was done in the US uh, some time ago about phosphate. Uh, phosphate, uh, how, how much phosphate was uh, 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 per gram of soil with uh, HOMA methods and with non-HOMA methods. Uh, different types of soils were tested and you can see in each case with the HOMA method, the amount of phosphate per gram was greater than with the non-HOMA methods. So this is another evidence that this HOMA organic farming is much superior to other methods of farming. Then I've got some more examples here of uh, uh, various uh, crops which have been uh, uh, grown over the years. Uh, in parts of India and also in other foreign countries. In this particular case, this crop was soybean, which was grown in MP, District Indoor. Uh, it was like an experiment, experimental crop to see what would happen with the home organic farming. And you can see the yield was extremely high. The yield uh, 2,105 kilos per hectare with the home organic farming as against 700 to 800 kilos per hectare with the conventional agriculture. And uh, color was superior and the roots of the plants also showed twice the number of nitrogen fixing modules. Then there was another case here from Karnataka in Belgaon district, one uh, homer farmer there, his name was Sri Abai Mutalik Desai. Uh, he at one stage had an attack of uh, Micromus igorotus and Diapha aphidivora uh, on his sugarcane crop. And uh, later he found out that this attack came due to using impure ghee in the Agnihotra and the Homus. But those uh, insects were immediately controlled by two natural predators. Uh, the uh, natural predators of the woolly aphid. Sorry, the woolly, woolly aphid was the insect which was attacking the sugar cane. The predators were the micromoss and the diapha. So, uh, that, that's a very good indication that insects are very much controlled very easily using this uh, HOMA technology. Then there's another case here of insect control. This has come from Bangalore in uh, uh, Karnataka. This was from the campus of the Art of Living uh, ashram in uh, Bangalore and uh, this report came from uh, Sri P.J. Joseph, who was the Assistant Director of Agriculture in Kasaragod uh, in Kerala. He, uh, had, uh, when, when visiting the farm, he noticed there was a severe attack of the, attack of the leaf-eating caterpillar pest, Nephantis serenopa. And uh, the attack was spreading throughout the whole farm. He recommended that they cut the severely affected leaves immediately and burn them. Meanwhile, on the campus, the youth leadership team had commenced Agnihotra in the area at the instigation of their guru. And three, day, three days later, when he returned to the farm, 
uh, Sri Joseph found that there was no more evidence of this uh, caterpillar pest on the coconut leaves. And he then recommended that they stop cutting the leaves and that he certified that the garden, the coconut garden was totally free from that leaf eating caterpillar. Then in terms of other countries, uh, homo organic farming is practiced in several countries now. Uh, here is a story from Austria in Europe. This was one of the very first homo farms. This was uh, in 1986. At the time of the Chernobyl nuclear accident in Russia, this particular lady, Mrs. Karen, she was working on this homo farm in Austria. And immediately after that nuclear accident, the Austrian government called for samples of milk and cow fodder to be tested for radioactivity. Uh, because that uh, radiation spread uh, dangerously all over many countries in Europe. When the scientists uh, tested the milk and fodder samples from this Homer farm, they were shocked to find that the milk and fodder on the farm had normal radioactivity, while all the surrounding farms had a much higher level of radioactivity. This is a definite proof that this homo organic farming method gives incredible protection against all types of pollutions. Then there's another incredible story, this time from Peru in South America. Uh, in 1999, they established a homo farming project in 3000 acres in Peru in the Amazon region of Peru, 3,000 acres. There were 30 farms, each of 100 acres, making a total of 3,000 acres. And for seven months, the agricultural officers from the offices of the presidency of the Republic of Peru monitored all the crops which were grown in that particular area, which consisted of plantain, banana, papaya, cocoa, citrus, avocado, coffee, tea, star fruit, mango, and also annual crops such as rice, corn, soybean, nuts, sesame, and also complemented with honeybees and cattle. They noticed there was a substantial reduction in the various pathogenic agents. All pests and diseases were completely eradicated and the yield of harvest was increased also. The fruit grew healthy with better color, taste, weight, and texture. And at the side there, you can see the certificate, the government certificate from the agricultural officer. Uh, it's in Spanish. We've had that translated into English where he makes his report. That's incredible. 3000 acres at a time tested for seven months. Then there's another story from this time from Indonesia about the mosaic virus, which is a very dangerous virus in the plant kingdom. There was one particular farm there that this particular guy was working on. He's an Australian guy called Luca Folietti. And this farm project was in Sumbawa in Indonesia, one of the small islands of Indonesia. This organic farm was three acres, only a small farm. And this, the project lasted six months from May to November 2018. When Luca first came to the farm, they tested the pH. It was more than 8.0, so very alkaline. The bore water was salty and the soil was mainly rock hard clay. So very, very difficult conditions for agriculture. Nevertheless, they started the project, the organic project. After the first few months, they noticed that some fruits were rotting from the bottom and a few leaves were turning yellow. Uh, Luca attributed this to the high pH in the soil. However, after three months in August, it was clear that it was the mosaic virus, which is affecting the whole farm. Later, he found out that mosaic virus is an extreme problem in the whole of Indonesia. 
So the owner suggested practicing Agnihotra. Luca had heard about Agnihotra, but he was very skeptical about, uh, however, because he was so desperate, he agreed to try this Agnihotra and the homotherapy methods. After a few weeks of regular Agnihotra, the virus was contained and not spreading to new plants. After five weeks, he was shocked to find that the pH had reduced from eight point something down to somewhere between 6.5 and 7.2, which is a very nice pH for growing vegetables. After two months also, the bore water was no longer salty. Earthworms had returned. By October, the place was flourishing, full of bees, birds, and also monkeys. So that's a fantastic story there from a skeptic, an Agnihotra skeptic, who managed to prove, in spite of his skepticism, that Agnihotra works very, very well against the mosaic virus disease. Then we've got another story here from Australia. This is from a farmer whose name is James Morris. He grows broccoli in this particular season. Broccoli is a very, very uh, nutritious vegetable. Uh, he was new to homer farming and uh, he reports that there were three applications only of the homer folia spray. That means homer folia spray means to take the ash, which is remaining after Agnihotra, the basma, uh, keep it in water for three days and then strain it. And that water can be used as a folia spray. So, he says that uh, compared to his last year crop, he had a phenomenal harvest. 2,875 kilos when he was expecting only 1,000 kilos. So nearly three times the quantity, what he was expecting. The quality and weight of the heads, very impressive. Germination was 99.9% .9 compared to only 90% in the control organic crop. And the control crop was also 75% slower to mature. So shorter vegetative cycle, no pests, no disease. Crop came in all at the same time, meaning far less labor and production costs. James says it was a perfect harvest. So another successful homer farmer. Then there's another story from Ecuador in South America. Uh, this is a, from a banana farm. Uh, this is from the 2008 uh, season. Uh, and on this particular farm, they started the Homer technology in 2008. Before that, for three years, they were practicing organic agriculture without Homer therapy. 2008, they started the Homer technology. And you can see in this graph the increased in the weight of the bunches here. This is the top line. This is the 2008 season with the homotherapy technology. Much improved weight of the banana bunches. And then here again, this uh, graph shows the number of hands or clusters per bunch. And you can see the light blue color at the top is also the 2008 se uh, se season. And you can see such an increase in the number of hands or clusters per bunch in that with the uh, homer farming methods in 2008. And in fact, uh, the, in that particular area, they measure the harvest in terms of boxes per hectare. And that particular farm, the Fuente de Alegria, which is highlighted in yellow here, had the number one production with 1,804 boxes per hectare, number one place for pro productivity in all of the banana plantations in the area. So fantastic result for homer farming there in Ecuador. Now, just before I finish, I'd just like to mention one more story. This story is also from UP in India, district Unal. This is another mango farmer. I mentioned one mango farmer before. This is another guy. His name's Kamlesh Singh. This particular guy suffered from diabetes. He started homer farming 
for his mangoes because they were badly affected with mango hopper and mealybug. He got a very good improvement in the mango uh, trees uh, in his garden. But what was surprising was the next time he went to the doctor in Kanpur for a checkup, he found that his blood sugar level had fallen from 300, more than 300, he was but diabetica, was more than 300, it fell to lower than 200. His doctor was also very shocked. How could this be? He said, well, I don't know. I just started homo farming and this is, this is what happened. And the doctor told him, well, don't worry. Definitely that uh, blood sugar will shoot up again. But to his surprise, the uh, blood sugar level has remained stable over the next few years. So that's a very, very wonderful story also. It means that uh, not only the plant health is improved with the Agnihotra and the Homa farming, also the human health is also improved. So in terms of global food security, Homa farming is the definitely the main answer which we should be going for now. Every farmer can become a happy farmer. Every village can become a prosperous village. Poverty can be totally eradicated. The whole of society can be transformed. We can achieve food security on a global scale with Homa organic farming. Thank you very much. Here are my contact details for anybody who wants to get in contact with me. I'd be happy to interact with anyone who is interested in discussing about homo organic farming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brucey Johnson, for your nice presentation on homo organic farming for global food security. Now I am requesting to Dr. Susil Dikshit. He is farmer environmental scientist from Queen's University, Kingston. He has completed his PhD in 1986. His major area of research includes environmental and climate changes. He has published more than 75 research articles in peer-reviewed international journals. He supervised over 50 projects of national and international importance and showed his presence in more than 100 national and international conferences and workshops. Now I am requesting to Dr. Susil Dikshit for his presentation on impact of food security and biodiversity on nutrition in developing world. Uh, thank you, Ashwiniji. Um, uh, at this time, I would really um, uh, uh, very thankful for uh, you organizing this session and uh, thanks to all the speakers and uh, participants um, uh, for, um, for for their attention to such an important issue that uh, that we all are facing uh, in uh, in developing worlds and also in developed worlds um, world uh, to a certain extent uh, i'm going to share uh, my uh, powerpoint um, so just see how how it works. Uh, let me start now. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, can you see? Uh, can you see the presentation now? Hello? Not now, sir. Not now? The screen sharing. The screen sharing, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Can you see the presentation? Here your uh, PPT. Yes, PowerPoint. Do you see that? No, sir. 
नहीं दिखाई पड़ रहा अच्छा कितना तो चाहिए डॉक्टर मोहित कुमार काइंडली हेल्प हिम डॉक्टर मोहित अब दिखा यस सर थैंक यू सर ओके दैट्स ग्रेट सो आई विल बी टॉकिंग वेरी ब्रीफली ऑन ऑन इंपैक्ट ऑफ फूड सिक्योरिटी एंड बायोडाइवर्सिटी ऑन न्यूट्रिशन इन डेवलपिंग वर्ल्ड आई मीन वी हैव रियली हर्ड वेरी मच अबाउट agriculture how to do in a sustainable way organic way and um, from dr bruce um, um, uh, about homo homo uh, uh, homo options so just in terms of the background uh, just just one minute okay ठीक चल रहा सर थोड़ा सा आप आराम से यस बैकग्राउंड आ गया सो इन टर्म्स ऑफ द बैकग्राउंड फूड इज फूड इज एसेंशियल टू ह्यूमन वेलबीइंग वी ऑल नो दैट एनहांसिंग द फूड प्रोडक्शन रिमेंस अ प्राइमरी गोल फॉर द डेवलपिंग नेशन एंड इट्स आल्सो ट्रू फॉर डेवलप्ड नेशंस ग्लोबली देयर आर मोर देन 100 मोर देन 1.3 बिलियन पीपल लिविंग इन पॉवर्टी स्टिल लिविंग इन पॉवर्टी इन 21st सेंचुरी Uh, nearly three fourth of them live in rural areas, uh, in villages, uh, and in small towns, and virtually all of them directly or indirectly are dependent on agriculture. Uh, though though uh, global food production has continued to increase uh, over the last fifty sixty years, however, over one billion people are still remain undernourished, and another billion people lack adequate uh, nutrition. and this is a serious thing i think um, though the production is continue to go we continue to still share some of these uh, these issues uh, in both um, in mostly in uh, developing countries uh, but as well, but also in in, in uh, some of the uh, communities of the developed nations as well yeah. uh, biodiversity is extremely uh, important in terms of the sustainable agriculture and also human health um, and and the production since um, 12000 years ago when human began uh, domesticating plants and animals agriculture bio- biodiversity has played a pivotal role in food security um, by sustaining and strength- strengthening food production overcoming mal- malnutrition improving health and poverty alleviation sustainable use of genetic resources of food and agriculture are are extremely important uh, for um, for uh, for agriculture integration of biodiversity into food security and anti hunger policies would generate more socio economic benefits including poverty alleviation our knowledge of biodiversity for food and agriculture must improve we need to give uh, a greater attention to biodiversity um and i will go a little bit more in detail later on on this and there needs to be strategies to address uh, nutrition problems that have uh, systematic and uh, uh, multi sectorial so in order to look into some of these uh, issues or solutions uh we need to attack on through uh, multiple fronts and and many of these fronts are very interlinked so i there are, i'm going to go through a series of major drivers uh, that can really help and and give some examples um one of the major drivers is uh, g- uh, gender empowerment and we know women and girls make up nearly half of the agricultural labor even more than half of the agriculture labor labor force in many developing countries uh but majority of them are undernourished they need to work very hard uh and they and they, they and they, they are spending major portions of uh, their day in uh, in in hard labor we need to be sensitive and need to develop approaches that can really help them 
um, to help them to improve their health. And also that's going to ultimately affect uh, the food production and security. Pot I mean, I, I can say potential solutions I need to focus on reducing workload, improving family diet. That's very important. And that ultimately going to increase their income and, um, and, uh, and livelihood. Um, other major driver is innovation. And that's where science plays a major role. You know. We need to develop and apply scientific innovation that increase yields while being environmentally and economically sustainable. Uh, enhance efficiency for farming, uh, various, uh, various types of farming, and adoption of climate, climate resilient agriculture practices. Uh, so, so this way then we can maintain sustainable uh, inputs uh, for agriculture, such as applying optimal nutrients, promote organic farming, uh, rainwater harvesting, drip irrigation. These are some of the some of the areas where technology has played a major role, and we continue. We need to continue to support some of these initiatives and look for innovative ways uh, to help uh, uh, attain uh, sustainable farming. Uh, the other driver is uh, uh, fostering market access. You can produce anything you want, but the if the market access is not there, it's not going to help uh, uh, our producers, especially small farmers. So, is small farming is is, is small farmers are are the are the major component of uh, farming, especially in developing countries. You know, how we can uh, how can we can involve. Uh, more youth and women entrepreneurs. Uh, and they are the one who's going to carry some of this workload uh, uh, for a uh, for long time. We can support communal farms because small farmers sometimes don't have that, uh, that luxury to approach market. So they need to work together. And I think there has been a lot of success in this run, but we need to continue to work on it. Supply chain and transportation from rural areas to urban areas where a lot of demand is or where, where the most of the supply is going to go, um, that has to be strengthened. Also, need to grow valuable products. You know, uh, there has to be a proper market um, uh, research. How how the sub, how how the need of the supply is, uh, what what people want, and we need to produce them. But don't get flown away with, uh, and we have seen some of the drastic things, you know, when farmers produce a uh, huge amount of certain certain products. And we've seen in India, like tomatoes or onions, they come at some time, you know, and nobody wants them, you know. So have uh, these farmers and communities have to be very sensible about that. Um, and we need to also realize that uh, food requirements are not homogeneous. Um, there are certain areas there are certain parts of the country which require different food. And some, sometimes, you know, these, these food products move from one region to another region as people move, and they bring some of these innovative and new food varieties, and we need to promote them. Uh, um, uh, reducing post-harvest loss, that's, that's, a major, that's a very, very important uh, driver. Uh, and we know uh, that about one third of harvested food is thrown away or even half of all food is lost. And, and the issue is um, both in um, developing countries and developed countries, but, but what get lost and uh, what need to, we need to preserve is somewhat different. For example, in developing countries, about 40% loss occurs after the harvesting and during the processing. Whereas in industrial countries, about 40% loss occur at retail and consumer level. So like industrialized countries, they have done a good job in terms of uh, uh, getting access to market and bringing it there, but then the loss is after that. Whereas in developed countries, uh, a, a greater amount of loss happens before even it gets to the market. So that, that's a very important issue. Um, we need to, I mean, in terms of the scientific aspect, uh, improved harvesting technology and reducing uh, reducing huge uh, food waste. Uh, that's going to be a major challenge. 
um, improving nutrition is, uh, is, is, a, is one of the major drivers. We need to integrate agriculture and uh, agricultural production and, nutri and nutrition across programs and sectors. Develop strategies to test, to test interventions. Uh, grow more nutrition, uh, nutritious crop. And I think um, there are some good examples, you know, many examples. There is a uh, potato variety that produces over two, 2 2.5 uh, times more protein than the commercial cultivar that have high zinc and iron. And that's ultimately going to help to improve the health and well being of the uh, users, you know. And um, uh, and help to uh, reduce uh, uh, deficiencies of nutrients. Promote home gardening. You know that that will help. That helps to increase production and provide fresh product, pesticide-free and uh, chemical-free product um, uh, to users. Uh, promote diversified diets and fortification. Um, aquaculture. Uh, I, in terms of agriculture, uh, in terms of the agriculture, aquaculture is also a significant contribution contributor, providing very um, uh, protein-rich diet uh, to mal uh, uh, nourished uh, rural uh, population. Uh, doing live livestock rearing. I mean, you might have very successful agriculture, but you can also rear livestock there, providing another form of. Uh, uh, crop rotation and diversification is also important. We all know that, but we continue to work on it and continue to work and develop technology-based uh, uh, crop rotation and diversification. Um, and above all, uh, community-based action to address local causes of, mo of male nutrition is very important because community can bring a lot of resources together, you know, and, and help each other. Education and training. This is um, uh, uh, my final slide. Education and training is extremely important. Uh, we know education and training are essential for addressing agriculture, biodiversity, nutrition, and poverty reduction. Access to education is lower among rural children, youth, and adults. We know that. And the gap is still there, you know. Uh, there has been some improvement, but there is still a vast gap between urban and uh, and rural areas. Um, we need to develop quality of education um, that's uh, that's needed in rural areas and university like SKU and some of these um, colleges that are being developed uh, closer to where a, a, a big population of uh, 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 a big of uh, people are living where there is a need is really going to help to intru uh, help uh, those communities. We need to develop curriculum that really works for um, or is uh, helpful uh, um, to, to rural uh, communities, to rural sector, because sometimes what, what's, uh, what's needed for urban education and um, application may not be applicable um, to rural areas. So enhancing the institution cap capacity for uh, rural development and food security um, is uh, is really critical. There has been uh, some very significant work has been done, but we all need to continue to work on this front um, to help our um, um, uh, rural fellows you know, uh, in, in terms of development. So this is all I had to present um, in today's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity again, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Susil Dekshetji, for your nice presentation on impact of food security and biodiversity on nutrition in developing world. Thank you very much. Now I am requesting to our next speaker, who is also chief guest of uh, this event today, Dr. Bimal Mohanty. He is an additional assistant director general, Inland Fisheries, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, New Delhi. He have more than 30 years professional experience 
former head of division and principal scientist at Indian Council of Agriculture Research and Central Institute of Fisheries Research Institute, Berakpur. He worked as assistant professor and as scientist. Current research is inland fisheries management, fish for food security, nutrition and livelihood, value chain and nutrition, clinical proteomics, and fisheries. So now I am requesting to Dr. Bimal Mohanty kindly present your research work on fish for nutritional security and malnutrition elevation. Dr. Mohanty. Sir, your PPT is but, here. Yeah. Your, yeah. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, because of some other preoccupations, I joined a little late. So, sorry for that. Now, I have seen uh, last few uh, one to two lectures and a uh, very interesting talk by uh, different speakers. And really, we have people from Canada, people from Australia doing very good work in India, and uh, several aspects are being covered. It's really a pleasant opportunity for me to present some of my work for you. So can I have can I have my presentation? Hello. I am not able to see my. PowerPoint. Am I audible? Hello. Yeah, am, am I audible? Dr. Asini Kumar? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Okay. So the uh, topic of my discussion is uh, fees for nutritional security and uh, malnutrition allegation. Uh, we are uh, uh, regarding different aspects of the uh, nutrition, uh, agriculture and uh, uh, different aspects. So my focus will be on fish as a very good source of animal protein, quality animal protein, and how it is going to help us in tackling hunger and malnutrition. Next one, please. Next one, please. Hello. Hello. The yeah, display is but somebody has to operate it, keep on moving. Second one, uh, somebody has to operate it, not oper operationable from here.
Is there a problem in operating? हाँ ओके 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 Uh, I can try. हाँ हाँ नेट ठीक है मैं देख रहा हूँ आप ओके होस्ट डिसेबल वो मैसेज आ रहा है होस्ट डिसेबल लैटेंड स्क्रीन शेयरिंग आप आप बंद कर दीजिए आप उधर आप उधर से स्क्रीन शेयर बंद करिए हाँ लेकिन मैसेज आ रहा है होस्ट डिसेबल अटेंडी स्क्रीन शेयरिंग मेरा स्क्रीन शेयरिंग वहाँ से बंद है क्या इट नॉट स्क्रीन शेयर कोई जगह से नहीं हो सकता है क्योंकि जितने ओपन दे आर इट इन नॉट एक्सेप्टिंग
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, am I audible? Hello. Uh, am I audible? Sir, please. Uh, I, okay. So, sorry for sorry for the technical glitch and it happens in the technology. Anyway, so <laughs> we'll quickly power up. So the discussion is the case for national security analysis. So we have several options available. We'll discuss how for such a vast global population and uh, we we think this uh, second most uh, populous country in the world. How we are going, going to tackle this uh, problem of national security and the statement by hypocrites. He said, let food be thy medicine. Means uh, your, uh, food, your food is your medicine. We should take it that way. Because if you are taking balanced diet or balanced food, the macronutrients, micronutrients. So we are taking uh, these carbohydrates, proteins, and oils or fats. Then uh, micronutrients like vitamins, minerals, and acids. So, body will get the sufficient uh, fuel molecules for its uh, maintenance. And if you are missing something, if you are not taking a balanced diet, there is a micronutrient deficiency, whether it is iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, or it is vitamin deficiency, it leads to several forms of disease. Now, coming to food security. What is food security? In simple words, we can say food security is a measure of the availability of the food and uh, individual's ability to access it. Simple. The uh, Food and uh, Agriculture Organization definition says that uh, food security has uh, four different important dimensions. So food will be there, then economic and physical access to food, that is very important, food utilization, and stability over time. If such a situation exists, then we say that uh, there, is food, there is food security. But uh, many times we do not see this to happen. And we find that uh, many times people in the uh, rural areas uh, who are monitoring and they are not uh, economically very sound, like 65 to 70% of the population, they face problems. So coming to hunger and malnutrition, when it is a chronic undernourishment, it, we call it as hunger. And what is malnutrition? Malnutrition means improper nutrition, and it can be undernutrition. It is prevalent in our cases, and you may find you will find that it is overnutrition, leading to obesity. Yeah. It's a very difficult situation in our cases, but in the Western countries, you find that it's a big problem. Of course, in India also, uh, you will find in the many of the urban that this is also coming as a, uh, becoming a problem. So looking for what are these, then different dimensions of the hunger. If you see the major nutrients like you discussed, the macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, liquid, like that, uh, the protein hunger. Protein de deficiency is one, one of the major challenges. Calorie hunger means energy deficiency. And the hidden hunger. Hidden hunger is the micronutrient deficiency. Micronutrients means vitamins and minerals. So that deficiency, you do, you do not be hungry for there is iron deficiency, the gene deficiency, vitamins deficiency, body remain hungry. And most of the metabolic processes, they depend upon the micronutrients. And in absence of them, metabolism deficiency. And uh, India is an exception to all. There are areas, this uh, protein deficiency is a major challenge. So uh, government has taken up, uh, India has uh, taken up the challenge of national mission on protein supplement, how to challenge this protein hunger and how to overcome such situations. Similarly, uh, or mass mass, you find that uh, this typical typical uh, condition you are seeing, uh, seeing, and many times you find that uh, this only protein hunger or calorie hunger doesn't happen alone. Many times they have protein calorie efficiency or protein uh, energy efficiency is a common cause. And these are mainly problem of the childhood and the kids, they suffer from these situations. And there is all sorts of deformity and depending upon at what stage they are uh, deficient for this, 
you'll find that mental retardation, uh, poor growth, uh, low birth weight. There, there uh, means even though after birth you find that again they are not getting the proper growth and that type of problems are there. And uh, for such things, you know that I am not going to tell the details of these uh, micronutrients what they do. But you know there is a number of vitamin A to vitamin C, B complex, vitamin C. You know several types of in their absence several uh, deficiency diseases come. And uh, the most important, most of the metabolic process are all affected because they need the biological form of the vitamins and minerals for the metabolism of all tissues. Now, with uh, all this uh, discussion on hunger and malnutrition, which is uh, so rampant, we are telling that uh, majority of people, they are facing this situation. Uh, even though we have a really a lot of upper stock of things available, but this is a problem. And particularly in the rural setup, the common people, the farming community, many times they face this type of situation. They do not get the real balance. In that condition, so I am going to discuss with you how fish is going to help us. So fish is an important component of the human diet. There are a lot of people who, uh, who eat fish also, although there are vegetarians. Fish is an important source of quality animal proteins. You know, plant proteins we get and animal proteins. Animal proteins also have specific needs. And fish is a very important source of quality animal protein. When I say quality animal protein, I mean to see the essential amino acids and uh, see of essential, non-essential amino acids, you find that it is high. And uh, it contains a lot of essential amino acids, which are the different roles we will be discussing later. Fish are also a resource of micronutrients, that is vitamins and minerals, especially the small indigenous fishes. The small fishes, the, they are nutrient dense, like uh, amylopterodon, mola, unta, so forth. These, these are small fishes, but the, uh, this amylopterodon, mola contains almost 20 times more vitamin A as compared to the major carbs. So when you think of the uh, micronutrients, that is vitamins and minerals, we must take small fish, small indigenous fish. Then fish oils, uh, they are a rich source of the polyunsaturated, particularly the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Uh, they are heart friendly and brain friendly. Brain contains a lot of DHA. And these EPA and DHA both are required for the heart and uh, for the brain, proper functioning, preventing atherosclerosis and other, many other things. Then uh, when we discuss the fish, other than carbohydrates, it contains everything. It contains protein. Any fish you take, you will find that it contains a 13 to 20 to 22 percent protein. Depending upon the different fish, of course, the variant protein content, you may find as high as 20 percent, as low as uh, 12 percent. So protein is there in uh, all fish. Then you find uh, 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 that oils. The fresh water of fish in, in generally contain less amount of oil, but uh, marine fish, there are very rich source of oil. Even cold water species, they are also very good rich source, uh, source of oil, EPA and DHA. Among the, I'll be telling you in detail, uh, some of the fresh water fishes also, they are rich in oil. That, that means, if you are taking food, uh, fish and rice, you are getting carbohydrate and rest of the things you are getting from fish. Or uh, you are taking uh, bread and uh, fish, you are getting most of the other things, carbohydrate plus remaining things you are getting from the fish. That's why it is important. Now, another thing is availability and affordability. These are two important things. Availability means India, India is a tropical country. We are uh, rich in uh, biodiversity. We have uh, brackish water, we have uh, marine water, we have fresh water, we have cold water. Different habitats across the country, such a vast country, we have all type of aquatics. And wherever there is water, we will find there is fish. And we have a lot of, we are very rich, like uh, Western countries, many countries you may find, only say four to five species of fish, or many species of fish. We are uh, very rich in fish biodiversity. We have varieties of fish. So fish is available. And fish is also affordable. Why it is affordable? You look for the different sources of animal proteins. You say you go for fish, chicken, mutton, beef, pork, so all these things. You see the other right, other proteins, they come at its price. Whereas for fish, it can vary uh, for kg of fish, it can vary as low as uh, say, seven, uh, 70 rupees. It can go up to say 2000 rupees also for Hilsa. Maybe big, uh, the cars may be 200, 400. There are other fish which are 700, like that. So there is a big price range. Because of this price range, and what all of them contain protein. 
सो ये कॉमन मैन होने गोस टू मार्केट ही कहीं जो वाइड रेंज ऑफ चॉइस फ्रॉम एटी टू सेवेंटी रुपीज टू से थाउजेंड रुपीज और थाउजेंड फाइव हंड्रेड रुपीज सो एज पर इज अफोर्डेबिलिटी ही कैन परचेज फीस एंड टू फीड द एंटायर फैमिली सो दैट से फीस इज अवेलेबल एंड अफोर्डेबल नाउ कमिंग टू डिफरेंट रोल ऑफ प्रोटीन्स वाई वाई वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ नेशनल मिशन ऑन प्रोटीन सप्लीमेंट एंड वाई देर इज सो एनिमल प्रोटीन्स आर सो इम्पोर्टेंट You see, these are the you see actin, myosin, troponin. Uh, the structural mechanics, enzyme proteins are there, hormones are there, their signaling molecules, their antibodies, uh, the the albumin, vasopressin, fluid balance they are required in acid base balance they are required. Their uh, molecular pumps, membrane pumps, and channels they transport proteins. They have several roles. So protein deficiency is, uh, we cannot manage. And uh, as of now, in, in this COVID nineteen, we are discussing that boosting immunity. So you must have a really proper protein diet and a balanced diet so that your body can cope. Even though there is no vaccine, we are surviving. So many of us are getting uh, naturally developing natural immunity against it. So protein diet is something very important. And uh, particularly coming to amino acids, proteins are uh, composed of amino acids. Amino acids have also there are several different roles. I'm sorry, I'm not going to read it. And uh, I will try to show you. Like if we are talking of hormones, there are specific amino acids like tyrosine. Say tryptophan. They go for several uh, secondary melatonin and epinephrine. Uh, several uh, secondary metabolic pro metabolic products. Hormones also you are getting from these amino acids. So these amino acids are also essential. So they must be present in plenty. Similarly, peptide hormones, glycoproteins, and uh, uh, like serotonin, dopamine, uh, this heme, hemoglobin synthesis. Many things are starting with these. Uh, Uh, amino acids. So amino acids are also very important in the diet. Coming to the oils, especially the polyunsaturated fatty acids, or the EPA and DHA. In the adult population, it is important for keeping. These are all preventing. It keeps the coronary heart disease away because it prevents atherosclerosis. In the elderly population, this dementia, age-related macular degeneration. So that uh, that means uh, uh, the vision is lost. Mood disorders. Mainly bipolar disorders. These are because of DHA of deficiency of DHA. So pediatric population, you find attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders, childhood asthma. All these things can be uh, prevented by having sufficient quantity of polyunsaturated fatty acid in the diet. These are all uh, studied in the medical history, and it, these are all uh, published reports. Nothing new in it. Similarly, why you are talking of so much of micronutrients or hidden hunger? See. Just have given a list of things to see. Iron. How many enzymes it they need? Iron. Catalase, cytochrome C reductase, nitrogenase, hydrogenase, calcium. For several like that, you see all the uh, minerals or the basic these elements. They are required for metabolic activity. In absence of that, the enzymes cannot work properly. They cannot perform optimally. So the metabolism is not proper. The metabolism is not proper means all functions will be affected. That's why these micro and nutrients are. Uh, So vital. Again, I am coming to the previous slide just to show that because of all such rich proteins, amino acids, uh, these oils, micronutrients, this fish is an important source of uh, many of those things. But all fish are not rich in everything, so we will be discussing slowly. That's why India is a, uh, India is rich in our fish biodiversity. We have several thousands of species, food fishes. So we must know what uh, what which fish contains. Which is rich in zinc? Which is rich in rich in iron? Which is rich in vitamin A? Which is in D? So how much protein? Which fish is rich in omega three, PFAS, EPA, or DHA? If we know, then we can make best use of it. That's why there is need for knowing food data or the chemistry of this understanding, so that we can make the proper use of it. That's why nutritional composition of fish is that important. So this is just I am not showing you to for reading. So in a project uh, for ten years. We studied the gross composition of uh, more than 100, say about 150 species. We have studied. We have uh, seven institutes across across the country, like CIFT Cochin, CMFR in Cochin, SIBA in Chennai, Bhimtal uh, Cold Water Fisheries, uh, CIFT Mumbai, then uh, Bhubaneswar Freshwater Aquaculture, then Inland Fishery Varakpur. So seven such institutes we have together studied the cold water fishes, marine fishes, fish water species, fresh water fishes, and uh, we have generated. Uh, important information on them. So 
we know that uh, which fish contains uh, which what is a uh, which fish is containing less than two percent, four percent, four to eight percent, or more than eight percent. Like that, all informations generated are also published and they are in the public domain. Similarly, uh, all the information about uh, more than hundred species you have generated, like uh, the amino acid composition of this is a paper showing twenty-seven species, uh, four species, but we have studied uh, many more. Just uh, these are samples like micronutrient composition of this is showing thirty-five four species. We have studied many more. Similarly, DHA is a content of the so. Indian food, and we have developed a database also, and uh, that in 2019 we find that uh, this paper is there. In this process, we have studied our our uh, food pieces thoroughly. In detail. we know the uh, approximate composition of that. We know what is the fatty acid composition, how much EPA, DHA, and other fatty acids. We know what is the amino acid composition. So we know what is the vitamins and mineral content of our species. So based on that, we can find out. Only I have shown the few, the top few micronutrient dense means vitamin. Only there are many more. But I have tried to show you only two some two species. Similarly, what are the ones which are protein rich? These are the ones which are oil rich. We find that in the study in the 150 species study. It is a migratory. It is one of the top species. Then about 2.5 percent oil and very rich with so EPA and DHA. This is followed by sardine, soil sardine, sardine oil long isps. Then among the best ones, you will find anavas testudinaceus, that is poi. It is also very rich in fibers. Uh, Then uh, also from a belange tengua, it is a state fish of Manipur, so that is also very rich source. Besides that, all the marine fishes there is in oil, and the cool water species of fishes also. Now coming to the micronutrients. I, I am just showing you two top species that which are rich in calcium. You know what are the species which are rich in magnesium? What are the species rich in phosphorus? I have shown you only two here, but it is a big list, and uh, this information is available. Of this, I will be telling you that uh, later you can find it uh, later uh, in the database which is uh, freely available, and in the database all these informations also will be going to get. But I am just uh, explaining. How we have studied our pieces in detail, so that we can make best use of it. If somebody is needing zinc, what are the ones? If the iron is required, which ones? So it is for clinical nutrition as well as for community nutrition. This can be best utilized. Likewise, I said the iron is species, copper is species, species rich. What are the species rich in uh, manganese, the selenium, and what of this we already have shown in the table? How the minerals are essential for our metabolic processes. So. This is a, again a uh, table. Uh, some journal asks us sometimes to prepare a chart like that, and uh, we have shown what are which uh, species is uh, rich in which type of elements like sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, manganese, selenium, manganese, zinc, magnesium, manganese, zinc, copper, like that. But uh, because we have now ICDMS, many other elements are also studied and uh, enrich our uh, nutrition knowledge base. Likewise. I am showing you the fat soluble vitamins. One of the species you see, this amblyproton mola. So this is a small and it is a species, but it contains about 20 times more vitamin A when you compare it with your cut uh, cut with the Indian major carbs. Major carbs are for proteins. The small pieces we should see that they are rich in vitamin minerals. They are rich in vitamins. And similarly for vitamin D, what are the pieces that are important? I have tried to again project the. You see that this mola and punti, these are species so nutrient dense, very rich in uh, many of the minerals. Uh, big fishes may be as low as 0.5 percent uh, mineral content, but the small fishes have around 4.5 percent mineral and mineral. So, in analysis, you see that they are so rich in minerals. That's why, uh, as a general policy, when you are a uh, general principle, uh, you are going to purchase. For each hundred thousand or fish, for each one kg of fish, go for two hundred gram of small indigenous fish. So the big fish we are taking for protein. Small fish along with protein, they are providing you the vitamins and minerals which you may not get in sufficient quantity from the big fishes. So remember a formula: thousand plus two hundred thousand gram of big fish or carbs. Then this molar quantity take two hundred grams. So this make a balance. 
so that micronutrient and protein and uh, all these things are available to you here i have just shown try to show you the iron and vitamin a they are so important for health and so we have tried to show uh, out of the fish studies which are rich in iron which are rich in vitamin a which are rich both in vitamin a and iron like in the middle have shown so that the chart can help us and the prawns you see and these vegetables they are rich in iron so likewise if we have this information so we can uh, choose fish as per our need then uh, another thing uh, comes so there are several species we may not be able to remember everything all the time of course database is available to see so uh, there are nutri smart species nutri smart means they are smart species rich in multiple nutrients they are rich in proteins they are, they have also uh, some quantity of oil they are rich in uh, minerals they have also some quantity of vitamins so if we are going to include some such species in the community nutrition program say for example say the mid day meal for the school going children we are giving mid day meal in the mid day meal if we are going to include these some of these fish then in that case we are going to supplement our uh, uh, growing boys or girls with uh, these uh, iron deficiency and all these again salt deficiency we are providing protein we are providing the uh, omega 3 pupas we are uh, providing the micronutrients so their growth will be proper development will be proper that's why some of uh, this is of course i have shown only few uh, for example the sample but then you can see the database and you will get a big list different because we are a vast country which area suppose somebody is in the marine uh, a uh, fish area somebody is remaining in the hills uh, where cold water fish is available um, somebody eating only inland fish means on the fresh water then they can choose what are the predominant species in their area and from that they can select and include in their programs so with all this information and the publication of this way all these things we have put into a database we have developed a database which is called uh, uh, nutrifish india so nutrifish india and in short we call it Uh, nutrifish in this database you just simply uh, google nutrifish in nutrifish in you google and you will be getting the database and in the database everything is given so you go to home page there is objective who are the consortium partners who studied it uh, so what are the different publications what is the methodology which you have followed to develop the, uh, and find out the values what is the uh, what then we have given a knowledge base then uh, into other databases globally also so you can get all the details are available and all the information i am telling you will be getting information from this so this is a database uh, and for the common people how they have to have access to this and can make best use of it so we later found maybe the only the educated people who are having access to everything computer uh, and other things they can go to the database of course the database was globally appreciated it has seen by world bank and other agencies so we developed the we developed an android app for this so we named it again nutrifish app this nutrifish app again uh, you can get uh, download it from the google play store really it contains all the knowledge base this knowledge base i will telling you just a few minutes the method because the you know what method you have to use the best available internationally yes so because of that we have given the methodology what are the publications so that the scientific and accessibility is in we have provided linkages we have given the knowledge base so in the knowledge base what we have done we have the data you actually you will get the mass composition of that you will be getting amino acid profile of katla katla you will be getting little fatty acid profile of katla katla But this nutritional uh, highlights what we have shown, like you are getting photo, so that you can identify which fish cut like that. What is its gross portion? What is its major uh, recommendable? Suppose a physician going to physician for some uh, ailments, physician can uh, keep giving the he can give this medicine. Along with that, you would need vitamin A deficiency. You have like amlet, uh, you take mula or kunti. You take uh, twice a week at least for uh, three months. So that means your natural supplemented diet is not natural supplemented with iron like that. So we have given which species uh, cattle are home regal. They are for proteins. These are the catfishes. This is uh, tenozoyl for recommended for EPA and DHA, omega three. 
uh, hill sack contains 20% more than 20% protein. You can get enough protein. However, for, from other fish, you will be getting protein. So, if you are looking for uh, EPA, you should target for hilsa because hilsa is very resourceful for oil sardines. Sardines again, omega 3 tubers. Like that, you must know that which fish it can be recommended. Like that, you have given. हम थोड़ा हम और रंजन से करें ठीक है Yeah, am audible? So all the information uh, we are discussing, you find that in form of documents, they are also available in the English, regional and Bengali, Assamese, uh, like therapeutic value of fish in different languages, marine fishes, cold water fish, bulletins, brochures, so that it is available to the public. And all these things you find that in the database, these are downloadable. Publicly download the documents from the database so that knowledge is available, it is available to the public. You can make best use of it. Uh, I said about the nutrition database. This database, uh, uh, World Bank has seen this, and uh, the World Bank has highly appreciated this database. And uh, similar to our nutrition, nutrition, they have also 2018 World Food Day, they started developing a uh, Developing nutrition thousand a new initiative. Uh, World Bank and FAO they started to develop a program nutrition thousand. And when they started in October 2018, World Food Day, where only more than 1,000 species nutrient profile days of life. A consumption to thousand days of first thousand days of life, which is essential for preventing mortality, proper growth, uh, preventing mental retardation, everything. So they have also started a program uh, that just encouraged and enthused by seeing our uh, this study. So, uh, so far, study in food uh, chemistry so has uh, been seen as a special article collection on the one food day uh, by the LPF. And they have some study in nutrition they have also encouraged that many countries should also come to Coming to the end, what do we see? It is really important for nutritional security as well as livelihood security because the vast population of our farmers they are also dependent on the multiple farm, farming, agriculture, along with animal husbandry, along with fishery, commerce, and fishery. Now, no, recently, there's a, like a problem on the most simple to Jodhana. have been allocated for because uh, it is one of the fish uh, aquaculture is one of the fastest going food production sector. The uh, second largest fish producing uh, country in the world, the second, first one is China. But we lack we have 5.5 times uh, more fish produced by China, so there is a huge gap. And, but we are projected by the year 2024, we are going to be the most populous country in the world. In, in such a changing scenario, we should have, we must guarantee uh, nutritional security. So, we must not finance production for commercial lot of emphasis on the sector and the future. And uh, you find that uh, three for three water. So, the economy is going to populate in the future. 
so we have to get nutritional security it is only from the blue economy so this is for spread these things properly this is of idea that what are the top species we should go for if they are not uh, breeding is not standard you should go for breeding for them you should go for promoting those species which are rich in say uh, omega 3 fatty acids like salmon is one of the top species in the western world similarly hilsa is one of the top species it contains oil content of 10.5 percent very rich in epa and dha that's why there is a huge program going on for promoting we can take care of our omega 3 supply to great extent of course we can look for marine and other sources as well so for elevating malnutrition similar fighting hunger and all situations we need food and again i am coming to the first slide when i said that let food be the medicine our food is food should be our medicine that means if we are not uh, if we are micronutrient deficient we are extracting them from the fish or some some such material calcium iron other things and we are taking nowadays you know food supplements almost all people are taking food supplements what are the supplements there are the nutrients because we are not getting we are not taking plant diet we are not getting the materials we are supplement but if some we if we are able to give it in the food so there is no need for uh, getting the thing as supplements like uh, for example omega 3 capsules pregnant lady they are taking omega 3 capsules if we are giving them fish rich in uh, oil so there is no need for separately uh, taking this dha horlicks dha horlicks or junior horlicks is available in the market dha has been supplemented to the horlicks but for a company he can afford it if you say tell that what are these species which are rich in dha he can directly take this uh, means from the main source and uh, they get enriched they become brainy so there is no need for taking the other things which are not affordable to them so these are the some of the advantages of such studies and it is in public domain we should make best use of it we should uh, i i think uh, most of you will try to at least uh, google nutrifish in database today you will also see the nutrifish app at least try to see this help others know these things spread the message information is available and this is generated by uh, your money government has invested and we have generated we should make best use of it to make a, um, our country healthy people can and there is uh, the seven institutes they have developed we have all developed uh, this project on the 2018 so it was running and you can go to page 2 and uh, we are thankful to the icr of course i was at sikri bagpur when we conducted the study So this march has switched now to the conference and uh, and uh, thank you for organizing uh, the university and uh, this person who are organizing it uh, for contacting me and uh, inviting me for uh, presenting my information and this is actually information which is to be uh, we should spread and in fact of uh, this opportunity and uh, i am very thankful to you Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I like that. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Bimal Mohanty. He was Assistant Director General from Indian Council of Agriculture Research in New Delhi. And now I am requesting to Dr. Jolly Rajat. She is a lecturer in environmental science, Bhawani University, Kilifi, Kenya, and uh, she will present on sacred forest as refugia of food sources in Kenya. Dr. Jolly Rajar and. Uh, before you start i would like to call dr syam sukla syam sukla ji is there okay please dr jolly you can start hello dr jolly you started yeah hello sir am i audible uh, yes and can you see my presentation cuz i see it's disabled 
to share the screen. Can you please enable me so that I can share my screen? Yes, kindly share your uh, PPT. Uh, it appears Mr. B Dr. Bimal Mohanty has started sharing. Sir, can you please stop? Then I can share. Dr. Mohanty, sir. Dr. Mohanty, sir. I think it's working out. Can you see my presentation? Am I audible? Can I start? Can I start, sir? Yes, please. Dr. Jolly. Okay. Just to reiterate, in case you cannot hear me or in case my video is lagging, uh, you can uh, just notify me. Yes, please. Thank you for having me in this international virtual conference, role of science and agriculture towards uh, global food security and rural development. It's a splendid initiative from Sri Krishna University, Madhya Pradesh. Congratulations. Uh, honorary Dr. Ashwini Kumar Dubey, uh, and distinguished researchers, scientists, and uh, all portfolio holders, a very good afternoon. And first of all, I'd like to thank, Lee, uh, thank Dr. Uh, Dubey for making me a part of this conference as a role speaker. Now, let me come to the topic. Africa as a whole is regarded as a wealth of flora and fauna. And uh, Kenya is an intense part of that. It's so enchanting to see the beautiful flora and fauna uh, embracing the region, uh, the exclusive flora inundating the region instigated me actually to uh, take this initiative and uh, do my research over here. Uh, however, as a botanist, uh, I only focused on the floral sect of the region. Um, well, we all know that uh, the beauty and the inten intensity of African forest, it is, it is laden with exclusive green exotic flora. And the community which is residing around these forests, they possess ethnic cultural values. So today I'm going to speak about how these forests play a role model to aid the needy community and uh, provide them uh, with a sustainable livelihood. So let me begin my presentation. And uh, that's what I uh, decided on the topic of my presentation for today as a sacred forest as refugia of food sources in Kenya. So I've just started my presentation with a picture, you know, so that you can just have a look on uh, how the Kaya forest looks. And uh, I'll just discuss why we call them as Kaya forest. Because like we have all heard mostly it's a forest, but why do we call them as Kaya forest? There's a reason why we call them as Kaya forest. So let me just take you to the historical background of Kaya, why we call them as Kaya. So basically, these forests are situated in the, in the coast of uh, eastern Kenya, towards the Kilifi, Kole, and uh, Mombasa County. If you come to Kenya, particularly over here, it's a coastal region. Uh, uh, and uh, these forests, they extend in a belt. Now, these kayas, they are actually residual patches and they have a certain area, mostly from 100 to 200 hectares of land. And uh, they, the concept of this kaya, it was 
long back. It started around the 16th century. And by the end of 1940, around the end 20th century, the concept of Kaya forest, it caught over. So the literal meaning of Kaya is a home, a home to the community over here, whom we call them as Nijikenda communities. So initially what happened uh, in, the, in the history, these people to hide from their enemies or to protect themselves, they used to go and seek shelter in the, in the forest. And Kaya meant home. That's what we started calling this forest as Kaya forest. So uh, this is just a picture of a Kaya sacred forest. Uh, you can see how dense and how exotic the vegetation over here. It's actually so dense that you can't walk in through the forest. You literally have to crawl. So when I had to do, when I was doing my research, literally I had to crawl between the, between the trees to lay the quadrants uh, apart from the community, which they uh, usually reside around this forest. Now, this Kaya forest, they are... Uh, regarded as uh, cultural sites over here. And they have a lot of biodiversity, different types of species you'll be find, we find flourishing nicely over here. And these forests are, uh, are um, taken as a national heritage site and they are protected from the National Museums of Kenya. Now, for me, there are almost nine sacred Kaya forests over here. My work was basically on two Kaya forests, which we call as Kaya Kauma and Kaya Solokero. Now, each forest, each Kaya forest is uh, joined with their, they have their own community dwelling in the villages around the Kaya forest. And they have their, uh, their typical uh, livelihood pattern. They have their typical culture. So here for the Kaya Kauma, it is uh, mostly prevalent by the Kauma community. And uh, for Kaya Solokero, it was uh, inhabited, uh, it is inhabited by the Jibana community. Now Kau, Kaya Kauma has been uh, taken as a, as a cultural uh, world heritage site from uh, the United Nations of Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Uh, in fact, they have also declared some of the Kaya as a world heritage site of which Kaya Kauma is one of them. And uh, in fact, Kaya Kauma is uh, also called as a primary Kaya because of the, because of the area it covers. It's uh, almost, uh, uh, almost 110 hectares in land compared to the secondary Kaya forest, which are a bit smaller. Okay, so uh, let's proceed. This is just a... Uh, an identification in front of the Kauma forest, Kaya Kauma, uh, declared from the UNESCO as the World Heritage Site here. And uh, actually, in fact, when I did my walk here, we need to seek permission also from the community who are taking care of the Kaya forest because any trespassers or anyone cannot go. They, it's their, it's their uh, cultural site and they have their beliefs associated with these type of forests. So communities are very linked to this forest. Now, uh, this is a map which shows all the nine Kaya forests. And I just uh, marked my workplace for Kaya Kauma and uh, Kaya Solokero. But there are other forests also all, uh, uh, across the uh, coast of Kenya spreading here. Now, just have a look on the uh, cultural houses in these sacred village. They have a typical pattern, the way they build. Usually uh, they take uh, the hay or the banana leaves and they knit it in a pattern, which is, which is very, very traditional. Uh, well, in the town, we will not get to see these type of uh, uh, these huts, which are there uh, in the sacred village. So I just thought I'll put a picture here so that it can just be seen. And they are actually in the center of the Kaya forest. So we need to go like almost 
probably three to five kilometers. And in the center, they have these huts and uh, they have their rituals over there. And they also have a graveyard and they have other uh, ritualistic ceremony, which they believe uh, they do in the center of in the Kaya village. So these, these huts there, they, they, they say that they are, they, they are the Kaya villages, which are inside the Kaya forest. This is just the traditional food, uh, which the people over uh, over here and uh, majorly in the Kaya forest people are, uh, uh, but they're more dependent on the food plants, which are mostly occurring inside this forest or in the area around. Uh, well, I can just name a couple of food. Well, it's a Swahili name, which they say over here. Uh, it's an authentic name like Hogali. Uh, they make it from the maize flour or the githeri. It's like... Um, it's a mixed uh, veg vegetables. Then we, we also have um, uh, cassava. Uh, it's the, they make either they, it's a very popular uh, fruit over here. So they, they make in a traditional way. There's a curry which they make. So just, I took a picture of some of the traditional foods. Okay, now let us come on the problem on this statement. Why the research we want, why, did, why this work was done and what else has to be done here? So now the problem is this, there is a threat to the indigenous knowledge on the food plant around the Kaya villages, which the community withholds with it. Now the problem here, what uh, I felt when I went and I, when I uh, dealt with the communities, with the people around there, is that the older generation, they were very well informed, but the younger ones, younger generation were not that much interested towards, uh, uh, towards their culture because there is no platform of communication. I think, and I think this problem is not only in Kenya. I think this problem should relate to, to everywhere, to India, to all the parts of, you know, the rich culture. We always say it is very digitalized now. So younger generations are not interested in inheriting their culture from their, uh, from their older generations. So I think this type of work, I think we should always have everywhere so that at least it is documented and that uh, knowledge doesn't fade away. Uh, because it is like here, it is not incorporated even with the Western education and there is no uh, knowledge being taught in, even in the schools. They do not know. There is no publication of these knowledge because some, they have their beliefs and values also. So they do not want to share uh, like all these problems. And I think this will be everywhere. It's not here. It will be everywhere globally. Uh, every rural area, every community is very rich. It just has to, it has to be a transmission of the knowledge there. So, uh, uh, so now basically uh, coming to the food plants, because for me, I did a research on every sector of plant. It was not only food because our platform is like that. I'm only bringing the, the food plants into consideration here. So they, they depend May, now here in the Kaya community, they are dependent majorly on every resources from the plants for their livelihood. Now, the approaches which I had to do to finish my research was four types of approaches. It was on a household level, whereby I had to find out which plant they use for their livelihood, which flora they are mo mostly using. And then on, even on the household level, you see here they say as a medicine man or the herbalist, mostly those people are dealing with the medicinal set of the plants because they don't go to a doctor or anywhere. They're just doing all the practices just in the village. So apart from uh, the food plants for the herbalist, I had to go for the medicinal plants specifically to interview them. And for the local communities, I seek information on every sector of plant, but the food, I will just show you which type of food they use and how they are using it. Now, this was the community survey. Apart from the community survey, I also went inside the Kaya forest and to do some uh, quadrant and transect study of there, then to document 
the food plants. Here I'll be showing you the food plants, but all the plants I have documented and it has never been done. And I would also, um, I would request people if they can come, if they can come forward and every region anywhere in the world, we need to explore. We need to explore our rural communities because they are not literate that much that they would come up and they would, uh, they would come up with their uh, intense knowledge what they have. So uh, this was my second approach. Now, for the third one, what I did, I had to ascertain the ethnobotanical and the sustainability of the plants, what they had mentioned. So uh, the food plants or the medicine, but here I'll be discussing only on the, on the food plants, but I had categorized them into food, medicine, construction, um, firewood species, decorative, beekeeping, any belief plants, because here people have a lot of beliefs with their cultures. So the belief plants, they have, there were so many categories of plant. And then we, I had to validate it. I had to validate it with, with the local medicinal formulation, uh, which the medicinal medicine men they had suggested me with the matching literature, and also did the analysis on the food plants if it is also used as any sort of medicine. So let me give just this is pictures of some Kaya elders who are the custodians, the custodians of these uh, these forests. Uh, this one is, we call muse as elders here. Muse means as a sir, as you refer them with uh, greetings. So it's Muse Ndale Vanje. He's the head, uh, the custodian, one of the custodian of uh, Kaya Sulokero. And uh, this Muse uh, Ndale Vanje, he's from Kaya Kauma, but it, I was very like, fortunate to meet him because after my research, he passed away. So uh, these are the Kaya elders, and it's, it's not only one people, it's a community of Kaya elders who are uh, the custodians of these Kaya forests, and they take charge of everything, a any happening inside the village, Kaya village, or anything, they are the ones to take care of that. Now, these, this is a map which uh, I am showing uh, the villages and the uh, uh, the rural areas which were surveyed and these are all adjoining the Kaya forest. So uh, you can uh, you can see here for uh, Kaya Kauma, uh, they, it, it has all these villages around and uh, the Kaya Solokero, down one is the Kaya Solokero. And these case, what you have written is, uh, which, what, what you can see here is the villages adjoining them. So majorly the villages in the, in the radius of uh, five to seven kilometers were surveyed to, to all the people, to all the communities, which type of plants they use and how do they use it, which parts do they use, like all information on the plants. And now let me give you uh, the site description of these two Kaya forest. So now what happens, any Kaya forest, it's usually on a higher altitude. So even you can see, uh, well, the location I have written mentioned here where it is found, but the geographical position will be a little higher from the sea level. So because the concept was that they used to hide on a hilltop. So they used to choose the forest, which was mostly on the hilltop so that they could see their enemies coming and all earlier you know, when, when people use, when this concept started. And the reason why for me to do these two forests for my research was it has uh, different types of vegetation, like the Kaya Kauma, it has a deciduous, that's a dry type of pattern compared to the Kaya Solokero, which shows a little evergreen type of pattern of vegetation. So, and also like some in Kaya Kauma, uh, Kaya village, there is no, none of the people are inhabiting now, but they do use the village as a shrine and they have their cultural events over there. But uh, for Kaya Solokero, we do have people living there. So uh, now uh, there were 18 villages around Kaya Kauma and nine around Solokero. So the survey was done for the rural people, the rural areas and the community. The survey was done in all these villages adjoining the forest. And you see here we used Kiswahili as a language of community. The main language over here, the local language is Kiswahili. However, like normally people understand English, but you know, if you go to these villages and all, eh, people, they're not that literate. So 
you need to have the local language of communication. But like for Kauma, they still have their own tribal language that is Kauma and for Solokero that was Choni. So I had to recruit enumerators uh, who are very fluent into this and then to explain them how to go and uh, get information uh, for my research, what, uh, what, what, what you want uh, the information for, from them. So uh, now they, there are actually uh, nine distinct ethnic groups over here um, in the community and uh, they are called as this. You can read over there. I have just uh, bold them, Giriyama, Digo, Choni, uh, Jibana, Kauma, Ribi, Rabai, Duruma and Kambe. Now these nine tribes, they are called as the Mijikendas. Usually when we, we, we come here in Kenya, usually people over here, they are all Mijikendas. Now it depends on which tribe we are going to, to, uh, to interact with them. So basically Kauma, Kaya Kauma is for uh, Kaumat community and uh, Kaya Solokero is for uh, Choni community. And what, what the language also is a bit different, but mostly it is the, they share the same dialect, which we call as Bantu dialect over here. So it's mostly 71% of their vocabulary is shared between, uh, between the communities. The language is mostly the same as the tribal language, but Kiswahili gets the dominant because it is the national language here. Now we are just mentioned here, the number of respondents to be very specific. When I went to these rural areas, to deal with the community and to get the information on the food plants here. Now, let us come on the results. Now, focusing only on the food plants, there were 37 different types of food plants which were stated by the population and the communities of Kaya Kauma and 54 from Kaya Solokero. Now, what has happened even I saw, I was even rechecking, some of these plants are not even documented and people don't even know. And uh, majorly these food plants uh, it, the, uh, on the, in the survey also, I could make out that mostly they take it as a uh, fruit and vegetables. And uh, they also use it um, as a yam they they use it and some they process and they eat so for uh, uh, the kauma and uh, solokero for the fruits it was 16 and 41 now there was a big difference which we saw here because uh, kauma because it's a dry vegetation so definitely more trees they do not flourish compared to kaya solokero and even further to narrow down even for the vegetables uh, it was mostly 27 and 31 reported species from Kauma and Solokero. Uh, now you see these vegetables, uh, it was then, you know, I had, because everything was documented in the, in the local names. So I had to get it uh, checked for the, uh, for the scientific name from the National Herbarium of uh, Nairobi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Aap kya baat aari, sir? And now these are the majorly uh, some of the important major vegetables which people over here they use, and uh, I have also mentioned their uh, uh, their vernacular names. So actually, the information I had to collect in their local uh, with the local names, and then to get the scientific name and then the English name. Now, majorly here the major vegetable, most popular one, I have just listed down. Uh, then you see here for the for the next the second one that is Adansonia digitata, which is the muyu or the English name is baobab. So this plant has got it's so it has so every part of the plant is beneficial to the community and it was so interesting whether it is the leaf or the stem or the fruit, every part of this plant serves some way to the community. However, the other plants, they use it as a leafy vegetable majorly because mostly the people, they're not that fond of spices over here. It's mostly uh, plain food, what they prefer to eat. So it's just the leafy vegetables and the families because further for my research, I had to categorize them into the different scientific families which they belong to, to get the nature uh, of the, uh, anyways, that was another work which I had done, get, get the nature of the different types of uh, plants they belong to. Uh, 
Now here, I am showing you the different fruits and the families. And this plant, which you see here, the picture I've just put for Adansonia digitata, one of the most popular plant over here, I think, and it has a good widespread, it's quite widespread in Africa, not only exotic to Kenya, uh, and it, is a, it has a very huge swollen trunk and uh, like the leaves they use, the fruits they use. So this one is a fruit, which I've just, I'm just showing you the picture over here. And these fruits, they call it as mubuyus. They take out, and I think Kenya is the largest producer of uh, baobab, even their largest exporter of that, because they eat like that raw. Also, they do some coating, sometimes different flavorings in that, in the food, in, 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 in the mubuyus they do, and they just sell it. So. And this is a very interesting, I, and I think this plant is also in India, but I think it's very popular over here. And uh, even here, this Landolfia, which is, they call it as Notoria, is also a very popular fruit over here. There's one, I put a picture just to show you Mifinesi. It's an Atrocarpus uh, family, uh, but it's a very common fruit over here, which people love. But majorly some of the list of the fruits, major fruits with the families, I have just listed here. Even Mufio Fio is a very common fruit here. So, uh, let me just go to the next one. Now this is, uh, the, some of the cereals and yams, which the people over here in Kauma, uh, they use. Uh, it's, it's the cow peas, which is very common, common cereal over here. Uh, even uh, leucas is very common. Now coming to the yams and tubers is the solen roots, what they use, like yoga. They have written the Swahili names as well. Uh, and uh, they, 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 you can just see some of the pictures, which I've just put the common cereals and yams in Kauma. Now, similarly, this is this uh, Manihot Espulanta, the picture which you see, it's very, very, very common over here. And uh, Kenya is the largest producer of cassava chips. They usually uh, shred it off into chips and then they fry it, give flavor. And uh, it's very, very common over here. So these are the major vegetables, which the community, the rural people, uh, they are dependent to, even though it is very popular over here. So these are the list of the, stop, of the, stop, 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 stop. the list of some of the vegetables which uh, and the families which they belong to. Um, now coming to the fruits for uh, Kaya Solokero, just listed down the major fruits here which the community is being benefited to and the families to which they belong to. These are the vernacular names of the different types of fruit. And you know, every fruit is so peculiar uh, with, with its own taste and the community are so dependent because majorly it is, it's not a processed food they eat. It is not even with the, they don't even cook. They just prefer to eat raw. So it's majorly the leafy vegetables are majorly common to them and these fruits are very common to them. So these are the list of major fruit fruits and the families from Kaya Solokero, which the rural people and the, uh, the community is dependent on. Now, this is the list of some of the cereals, which is very common. And you see the, the first one which you read here is Mambazi, Mbalazi or Mahazi, they say. It's a scientific name is Kajan as Kajan. And that one, they, it's a very popular food and very loved food from the people. They usually eat with Ugali. Ugali is, a, is the maize, maize flour actually, but it's like a processed maize flour. It's a staple food over here. So basically for them, the like one of the delicacies, I should say, is the ugali and the mbalazi or maazi, they say. And this yams is basically the mriga, this important one I've just uh, listed here. I put my batatas, uh, also they like, but mriga is uh, majorly the yams what people like to eat over here. So this is now, this is just a, uh, top five food plants which are flourishing in the inside the forest because apart from the community survey i also did the forest survey and i'm just documenting the food plants over here which which is very much which is aiding the people which is aiding the community over there and the percentage occurrence of each and every food plants so you can just read out the the names here for, but uh, and I have some pictures which I can show you, which is very exclusive and very interesting to look into.
Okay, now you see uh, this plant, which we they call it uh, Croton pseudopulchellus. Yeah? They usually call it as Myama vanica. That's the common name what they uh, refer this plant. Now the stem, even if you break the stem, it has and you smell, it's such a nice flavor. So what they do, they usually burn a little bit, they roast the stem and put it in a bottle. The bottle gets flavored, they take out the stem and then they put the milk and then they drink. So I found it so interesting. I just thought I'll put a picture of that. Similar, like majorly a very exotic floras. I, I see the people are getting benefited. Now the next one, what you see, this is called as Adenium globosa. Uh, the, the stem of this plant is so solemn. It's so unusual to, wa to watch this plant. And, and they even they use this stem to feed the hens you know, the, so that the hens become quite fertile. This is what they are using in the village. The, so th this one, and like I had to record them with the vernacular names. So every plant was again being tested. And then in, even scientifically, like when I tested it in the lab, it, it also produced, it was, show, it was showing that yes, it has nutritive as well as medicine. Dr. Jolly, can you sum it? Sorry, sir. Can you summarize it? Oh yes, sir. Uh, you want for you want me to? Please. Okay, fine, sir. Now uh, let me go to the to the next. There are some of the edible fruits of Kaya Solokera. Uh, distinguishing fruits from there. I'm just showing a little bit of pictures, and this is just the transition in the housing pattern. What uh, the rural the community over here how they they live into now now you can see the third picture the way they are constructing you see so slowly what has what is happening the culture they are transitioning to a to a new way of uh, livelihood so slowly the culture is fading away and that's what we are trying to document on that so i'll just conclude uh, that these villages and these people in the villages, they have very rich and intense knowledge. And uh, they carry a very rich ethnobotanical culture, but the westernization is getting a big threat because the youngsters are not uh, interested. Uh, and so we need to urgently uh, need to preserve this knowledge. And I think this also has to be done in every part of the world, in India, everywhere, wherever we are, it's, it's good to conserve and promote the utilization of the plants, different types of plant, food plants or other plants. Well, these are the different research papers uh, from America and Canada and UK. They also, uh, they applauded us for our work. And these are the various research papers which has been published into international journals. You can just have a, these are the different work. So, well, and, uh, uh, I'm very thankful to the National Museums of Kenya. In collaboration with them, I was able to accomplish this work and document the knowledge on the various strata of indigenous plant, which are used by the rural community over here. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri. She was from Kenya and uh, discussed about. Guru Janon ka mera charan shukar dandavat pranam. Aaj ke is online platform ke madhyam se sabhi Guru Janon ko mera jo hai bahot bahot. Important food plants in the rural area of Kenya. Now I am requesting to Dr. Syam G. Sukla. He is an assistant professor of biotechnology, Mata Gujri Mahila Mahavidyala Jawalpur, Madhya Pradesh, India. He will discuss on biotechnological potential of rhizospheric fungi for weed management of leguminous crop. Dr. Syam G. Sukla, Kindly summarize your work and uh, brief here because time is becoming much over here. Thank you. Thank Dr. you very much, Kyan sir. Actually, I was waiting eagerly from uh, uh, Kafi Samesem in Tajarkarath. I see this. 
and before going in detail first i would like to thank and congratulate the uh, vice chancellor pro vice chancellor and chairman and especially organizer uh, dr ashini dubey sir coordinator and uh, of this uh, webinar for organizing such an very uh, excellent uh, and uh, uh, inviting very eminent speakers from all over the world and uh, Uh, many many congratulations to uh, all uh, uh, organizers or uh, organizing team members and uh, respected eminent speakers i am uh, i dr shyamji sukla from department of biotechnology mata gujri mahila mahavidyalay uh, uh, today i will uh, like to discuss on biotechnological potential of uh, rhizosphere fungi for weed management of uh, leg minus props so before sharing my ppt main kuch cheeze aap log se share karna chahunga ki hamara desh jo hai ek krishi pradhan desh hai aur krishi pradhan desh hone ke nate jo hamari puri desh ki krishi hai aur jis tarah se lockdown ke time pe ek bahut hi mahatvapurna jo hai role play kiya gaya hai to हम ये देख सकते हैं कि किस तरह से जो है इस लॉकडाउन पीरियड में हमारे जो फार्मर्स थे इनके द्वारा लाया हुआ पूरा जो अनाज था वो आम जनता तक पहुंचा है और उससे लोगों को जो है बेनिफिट मिला है तो ऐसे बहुत सारे एस्पेक्ट हैं जो आज डिस्कस करने की ज़रूरत है और जो इतना इम्पॉर्टेंट थीम डॉक्टर अश्विनी दुबे साहब ने जो है सेलेक्ट किया है तो निश्चित ही मुझे ऐसा विश्वास है कि हम किसी एक अच्छे नतीजे पर पहुंचेंगे क्योंकि समय बहुत ज़्यादा हो गया है मैं ज़्यादा समय ना लेते हुए अपना पीपीटी के माध्यम से आपके सामने कुछ चीज़ें रखना चाहूँगा और just wait i am sharing my ppt once again very very thank you to all participants and uh, uh, dear uh, eminent speakers from all over the country we are going to discuss biotechnological potential of rhizospheric fungi for weed management of leguminous crops so sabse pehle to hum ye discuss karenge ki anant bhavati bhutani iska matlab ye hota hai bhagavad gita ke third chapter mein likha gaya hai the human being is made from food it means ki food jo hai wo bahut hi important cheez hai and it is special in social and cultural context also and why it is important because food and nutrition food is what we eat while nutrition is the combination of process by which we utilize food and you all know about the nutritional requirements of body there is two types of nutrients macronutrients and micronutrients and in micronutrients protein carbohydrates fats water and in micronutrients vitamins and minerals i think ki earlier uh, professor uh, bimal mohanty has described so many things so i need not to go in detail ki what is the role of food and nutrition for our healthy life and for our healthy diet just i am giving the brief introduction about the nutritional requirements of body why we should think on that and this is very important part the important of leguminous crops why it is important for human beings and for healthy diet because legumes are the second most important group of plants and they are the major source of protein in the vegetarian diet agar hum vegetarian hain to hamare protein ka jo sabse bada source hai hamare leguminous crops hi hain aur ek cheez aur highlight ki gayi hai do bahut hi acche speakers jo hain ek john bruce sahab ne 
इस चीज़ को हाईलाइट किया है कि मध्य प्रदेश जो है वो सोयाबीन के प्रोडक्शन में सबसे अग्रणी देश प्रदेश हमारा कहलाता है तो इसकी तरफ हमें ध्यान देने की बहुत ही ज़रूरत है और हमारा मध्य प्रदेश लेगुनस क्रॉप्स के लिए वैसे ही बहुत फेमस है तो इसलिए इस दिशा पे रिसर्च करने की जरूरत है और इस दिशा पे डिस्कस करने की जरूरत है डिसाइड प्रोटीन दे आर ऑल्सो मेजर सोर्स ऑफ डाइट्री फाइबर कार्बोहाइड्रेट्स एंड डाइट्री मिनरल्स मीन्स कि कार्बोहाइड्रेट्स फाइबर्स एंड मिनरल्स आल्सो प्रेजेंट इन अवर लेगुनस क्रॉप्स लेग्यूम्स आर ऑल्सो एन एक्सेलेंट सोर्स ऑफ रेसिस्टेंट स्टार्च विच इज ब्रोकन डाउन बाई बैक्टीरिया इन द लार्ज इंटेस्टाइन टू प्रोड्यूस शॉर्ट एंड फैटी एसिड यूज बाई इंटेस्टाइनल सेल्स फॉर फूड एनर्जी दिस अ वेरी इंटरनल पार्ट and uh, and it is very important ki why we should take legumes and why why we to uh, take we should take we should take some other leguminous crops for our diet and soybean is the major legume crops and today prominently figures in the crop priority of the central india contributing to major percentage to the total legume in the country kyunki samay ka abhav hone ki wajah se main apni speed ko bahut hi tezi se kar raha hu to main kshama chahta hu sabhi participants se और आज इस प्लेटफॉर्म के माध्यम से जुड़े हुए सभी जितने हमारे रिस्पेक्टेड सर हैं रिस्पेक्टेड जो हमारे एमिनेंट स्पीकर्स हैं कि समय का थोड़ा सा अभाव होने की वजह से मुझे स्पीड में बोलना पड़ रहा है अदरवाइज वेन ओवर विल आई विल गेट टाइम देन डेफिनेटली आई विल डिस्कस इन डिटेल हैंस डिस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ लेगुनस क्रॉप बाय बीट्स लीड्स टू सीवर प्रोटीन डिफिशियंसी इन द डाइट ऑफ ह्यूमन बींग्स विच अल्टीमेटली कॉज माल न्यूट्रिशन और माल न्यूट्रिशन को विमल मोहंती जी ने बहुत ही अच्छे से डिस्क्राइब किया है कि माल न्यूट्रिशन क्या है कुपोषण की समस्या हमारे मध्य प्रदेश में सबसे बड़ी जो समस्या है वो कुपोषण की समस्या है और जो आज हम प्रोडक्शन कर रहे हैं चाहे वो कृषि के माध्यम से हो या किसी सोर्स के माध्यम से हो क्या वो पर्याप्त है हमारी यहाँ की जनता को और यहाँ के माल न्यूट्रिशन कुपोषण की समस्या को खत्म करने के लिए सबसे पहला क्वेश्चन तो हमारा यहाँ से स्टार्ट होता है एंड दिस स्लाइड सोज एक्शन ऑफ न्यूट्रिएंट्स ऑन ह्यूमन बींग्स अगर अच्छी ह्यूमन को डाइट दी जाएगी तो डेफिनेटली उसका इम्यून सिस्टम बढ़ेगा और इस तरह से ये प्रोटेक्शन अगेंस्ट डिसीज के बारे में बता रहा है कि जो इंसान का हेल्थ अच्छा होगा अच्छी डाइट लेगा जो आज जैसे कोरोना की महामारी है कोरोना जो है हमारे बॉडी में एंटर करने की कोशिश करता है अगर जिस इंसान का इम्यून सिस्टम स्ट्रॉन्ग रहेगा अच्छी प्रोटीन डाइट लेगा तो कोरोना हमें अटैक नहीं कर पाएगा स्लाइड चीज को बताती है कि हमें न्यूट्रिएंट जो है अच्छा लेना चाहिए और ह्यूमन के लिए जरूरी है दूसरा एनर्जी एंड प्रोटीन की क्यों जरूरत है ये एक नीचे टेबल बताई गई है जिस टेबल के माध्यम से हम समझ सकते हैं कि अलग अलग एज ग्रुप के लिए हेलो इज एनी प्रॉब्लम यस सर Yes, yes, sir. And what is protein energy malnutrition? And this is uh, this picture shows the protein energy malnutrition PM. And uh, Dr. Mohanty has already described so many things about the deficiency of protein, uh, like malnutrition and some other. Things. And so symptoms of vitamin def uh, vitamin deficiency. So many diseases uh, arise due to the uh, deficiency of proteins and vitamins, like B complex deficiency, angular dermatitis. Keratomalacia, night blindness, rickettsia, and so on. And this is the uh, malnourished uh, child. This picture. And uh, this is also the malnourished child. This is the status of our MP. These MP ki photo hai, jo is cheez ko batati hai ki humare MP mein bahut badi jo hai malnutrition ki samasya, kuposan ki samasya. And this is the challenge. And this is a major problem of 21st century. So we should solve this by. Uh, our agriculture system and this uh, this is the uh, graph where uh, the green part shows the maximum production of soybean in madhya pradesh and these are the leguminous crops of mp like chickpea and uh, the sisa rednum and these are the major leguminous crops of madhya pradesh so and what is the role of weed in destruction of leguminous crops kya karte hain ye weeds jo hai ki they are ubiquitous pest in agriculture claiming the own share of light nutrition and space ye competition karte hain aur jo hamari main important crops hoti hai uske sath competition karke maximum part jo le lete hain to jo hame production hona chahiye ek example ke madhyam se bata sakte hain ki agar hame 10 quintal ka production hona hai to hame 5 quintal production hota hai kyunki ye hamare jo pest hain jo hamare agricultural jo uh, enemies hain ye isse apna share kar lete hain and parthenium histophorus is a major uh, 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 beet of the Madhya Pradesh, 
uh, it was found in uh, leguminous crops and cyanodon dactylon cypress rotunda c forvia hita and comilina bagleensis and uh, and some uh, other uh, weeds are very important prominent weeds of madhya pradesh we can say and uh, and you all know about the definition of weeds i think i need not to explain about the definition and what is weed you all know about the weed weed it is a economic plant whose economic value is not known is known as weed plant growing where nothing should grow is known as weed and what is the production status of leguminous crops in mp and the maximum production of uh, soya bean uh, was found in the uh, mp region so we should concentrate on that and these are the beets of uh, leguminous crops these are the major beets of leguminous crops and we have uh, uh, find found out uh, find out find out from the different places by survey and sample collections hypis genthium polygonum corcoras acaeranthas aspera ejeteratum alternatheria and sida cuneta urena lobeta jujupa jujupa these are the major beets of madhya pradesh and this is the historophorus and this picture is very important ye arhar ka ek plant hai jisme pure ko parthenum historophorus ne cover kar liya hai and this is the genthium stumerium it is very dangerous and these are the cyanodon dactylon jisko doop kehte hain doop ko hum apne puja mein bhi use karte hain but it is very dangerous for leguminous crops and comelina bagleensis and uh, cypress rotundus so what is the problems due to the beets because added protection cost from other pests and it increased cost of labor and equipment so this is the major problems due to beets so we should think on that and what is the problem not only for agriculture sector it is also for the human beings kyunki so many diseases uh, caused due to the uh, beets like contact dermatitis eczema eczematoid dermatitis and this is the picture uh, this picture shows the different types of diseases caused by the beets of uh, found in the leguminous crops of madhya pradesh and what is the uh, status the losses due to beets अगर हम ये देखते हैं तो पता चलता है कि सोयाबीन क्रॉप्स में जो बीट्स की वजह से लॉस होता है सबसे मैक्सिमम होता है 40 टू 60 परसेंट अगर 40 टू 60 परसेंट लॉस बीट की वजह से होगा तो हमें निश्चित ही जो प्रोडक्शन मिलना चाहिए फाइनल प्रोडक्शन वो कम हो जाएगा तो इसलिए एक बहुत बड़ी समस्या है और इसको सभी लोगों तक पहुँचाने की ज़रूरत है इस पर रिसर्च करने की ज़रूरत है एंड वाट इज़ द स्ट्रेटीज फॉर बीट मैनेजमेंट वी शुड थिंक ऑन इंटीग्रेटेड पेस्ट मैनेजमेंट वी शुड वर्क ऑन इंटीग्रेटेड पेस्ट मैनेजमेंट बट maximum we should work on biological control because biological control is the eco friendly approach and no uh, harm to the environment so we should think on biological treatment and these picture shows some uh, different types uh, types of uh, uh, weed management like conventional methods like plugging mulching and hand weeding in business these are very tedious and time consuming and these are chemical methods of weed management these chem chem chemicals are used for the weed management but they are very dangerous they cause cancer and some other uh, very dangerous diseases to the human beings so we should stop uh, immediately for using these chemicals and these are the chemical herbicides used in the leguminous field like uh, alaclor nitrofen malathion gamexen all these chemicals used in the weed management so what is the demerits because injury to non target organisms and so many other uh, demerits of the chemicals used in uh, for, for uh, using in the weed management and biomagnification easily run off best storage transportation and disposal problems so we should not use chemicals for weed management why we should use uh, biological agents for weed, uh, weed management because they are eco friendly they are cost effective deliberate use of natural enemies to reduce the density of a particular weed to a tolerable level reduction of weed population to an economically low level by the use of biological control agents and some other this picture shows the infection of parthenum by scorpion rolfsi scorpion rolfsi is a very prominent pathogen which uh, cause destruction in weeds means uh, uh, scorpion rolfsi hai it is a very important uh, strong uh, biological agent for management of the weeds and what is biorational strategy this is the main part of this uh, presentation ki we should use biorational uh, strategy means ki we should use metabolites of the fungi and we should use phytotoxin extracted from the fungi for the weed management of leguminous crops and why uh, 
we should discuss on rises ferric fungi and soil fungi what is the beauty of fungi because fungi are not only beautiful but they have play a very significant role for the every walk of life like agriculture medicine food textile biomediation and have therefore become the integral part of the human being that's why we should think on uh, um, fungi because uh, the medicine ke field mein agar hum dekhe to jo revolution hua tha jo alexander fleming jiske naam se jane jate hain wo ek fungi hi tha jise hum penicillium kehte hain usse penicillin namak compound jo extract kiya gaya tha तो इसलिए ये फंजाई हमारे एग्रीकल्चर सेक्टर में भी एक बहुत ही अच्छे कैंडिडेट साबित हो सकते हैं इसलिए हमें इन्हें ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा यूज़ करना चाहिए और इनके बायोटेक्नोलॉजिकल पोटेंशियल को हमें यूज़ करना चाहिए एंड दीज आर द मेटाबोलाइट्स विच हैव ऑलरेडी बीन कमर्सलाइज बाई डिफरेंट नेम्स लाइक अल्टरनेरिया अल्टरनेटा द फाइटोटॉक्सिन एक्सपेक्टेड फ्रॉम टेनोजॉइक एसिड एंड इट इज एफेक्टिव अगेंस्ट दतूरा इनऑक्सिया एंड सम अदर Uh, compounds and they have commercialized they have isolated they are purified forms so uh, realizing the need and importance of these rhizospheric fungi uh, we should think on some uh, other aspect of rhizospheric fungi these are the patented mycoherbicides we are already patented so many uh, mycoherbicides for for in the field of uh, agriculture like coligo from colitotrichum and biomel from colitotrichum glycosporides and dbind from phytophthora palmivora and velgo from the colitotrichum coprorides and this is the research plan because the time is very limited so i would not like to discuss the research plan if anybody is interested to do research in this field they can contact with me in future also ki this is the uh, the ray diagram yeah this is the outline of our research plan ki we can go by using these steps and finally we can uh, find out some uh, good results uh, for the weed management of leguminous crops and these are the uh, continuation uh, continued part of uh, research methodology and and these are my findings ki we have isolated so many <coughs> rhizospheric fungi and soil fungi from different parts of madhya pradesh like uh, panagar bargi and uh saipura hitoni narsingpur and so many other places and they have uh, we have isolated we have preserved them and we have identified them and we screened for herbicidal potential so presently we have 30 to 40 phytopathogenic fungi having herbicidal potential so if any what is interested to do research in this field they can take uh, uh, samples of uh, rhizospheric fungi uh, fungal samples from me They, we, we can provide because we are also working on the germ plant culture collection center and these are the photographs identified um, isolates of fungi aspergillus pyrebus aspergillus niger carbolaria lunata fusaria marxis forum cretomium cladosporium clototrichum galbularia carbolaria alternaria alternata and drusillera elminthosporium rhizoctona solnis cortisol rolfsi and these are some uh, <coughs> results ki we can uh, do our research like that and these are the field trials we have also done our field trials for the control of parthenium weed and for the control of cypress rotundus which is very prominent weed of leguminous crops and this is the uh, parthenium hystrophorus plants uh, uh, and very uh, much uh, scorsum rolf sai is very much effective against uh, parthenium hystrophorus so finally i would like to conclude uh, why we should uh think on rhizospheric fungi for the weed management of leguminous crops why leguminous crops or research on leguminous crops is important because biological control a potential approach for weed management why because exploration and screening of rhizospheric fungi may lead to uh, this this is actually the conclusion conclusion part increased agricultural production is a need and challenge for the developing countries one of the reserves of agricultural production is the reduction of the damage traditionally caused by weeds and second weeds and alarming three to four security agar weed ka population badh raha hai to ye hamare liye ek bahut hi bada alarm hai ki jo food security hai usko ye nuksan pahuncha sakte hain aur hame hamare desh ko jo hai iske is disa pe sochne ki zarurat hai the damage caused by weeds is seen in various ways and a serious it is affects various agricultural processes weed cause problems uh in different ways like competition with crops for nutrients water and light the release of roots exudates and foliar leachates toxic to crops 
the creation of a flavor habitat for the proliferation of uh, some uh, other and it also interferes with the normal harvesting process and the contaminants to uh, uh, <coughs> cause the harm to the uh, plants and biological control why we should opt for biological control because the potential approach for weed management exploration and screening of rhizospheric fungi may lead to discovery of some new novel bioactive compounds which can uh, further we can go for patent also these compounds after extraction could be used as a broad spectrum herbicide against many weeds through genetic engineering techniques suitable modification could be done for improving the production of herbicidal compounds from rhizospheric fungi and this whole approach could lead to the development of atmanirbhar bharat so agar atmanirbhar bharat ki hum baat kare to hume apne krishi ke kshetra ko krishi ke jo hamare field hain jo crops hain unko sudhar banana padega farmers ko jo hai hame strong karna padega और रूलर डेवलपमेंट की तरफ हमें ध्यान देना पड़ेगा तो इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ समय बहुत ही कम था और मैंने बहुत ही स्पीड के साथ कहा है हो सकता है कई लोगों को समझ में नहीं आया होगा तो इसके लिए मैं क्षमा चाहता हूं बट मैं आ, इस दिशा में लोगों को चाहता हूं कि ध्यान आकर्षित करें और इस दिशा में रिसर्च करने की सख्त जरूरत है थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर अश्विनी दुबे सर कन्वीनर ऑफ दिस फंक्शन फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी फॉर प्रोवाइडिंग दिस प्लेटफॉर्म थैंक यू वेरी मच टू ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर श्रीपोर्टेंट we got from last three from days discussion i have noted all the point from all uh, experts speech i will file that and uh, after that i will send to you one copy or kind record and uh, definitely uh, this uh, three days conference uh, will be beneficial for uh, Uh, food security and uh, rural development for nation so first no least uh, like to uh, request uh, honorable pro chancellor dr girish tripathi ji please uh, say a few words about this uh, <coughs> international and uh, uh, if uh, participants are interested to discuss then we can uh, get 5 minutes time for this sun so if you have any point that you can <coughs> tell us and if you have any specific recommendation government uh, that uh, you can mail to me which uh, uh, mail i already sent to you and you can send me two or three points maximum two or three point recommendations for our progress board Dr. Rita Bhandari, uh, would you like to suggest? Um, yes, sir. Um, please open, Hello. open, open all new uh, call. Hello, sir. Yes, madam. Yes, sir. Would <laughs> you like to suggest? Uh, Two, three points uh, for the valuable friends. A very wonderful webinar, really very knowledgeable and uh, useful webinar. I like it and congratulate to all the participants as well as speakers and the organizers. <laughs> Thank you. So now I am requesting to Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Grish Tripathi for vote of thanks. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here we conclude our international virtual conference 2020 with theme role of science and agriculture towards global food security and rural development. I would like to thank. 
Sri Krishna University and Honorable Chancellor Dr. Brajan Singh Gautam Ji and Honorable Chairman Dr. Pushpan Singh Gautam Ji for providing us such a good platform so that we can continue our international virtual conference for three days. I would also like to thank Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, uh, Dr. Gobind Singh Ji, who is also the president of this international virtual conference. Now we come first to the invitee speaker, Dr. Adam Ahmed from Saudi Arabia. I'm very, very thankful for your lecture, for your uh, speech on role of e-agriculture enhancing food security. You have told us the innovative use of information and computer and technology in rural areas and some relevant successful stories. You also told us about the climate smart agriculture. I would also like to thank Dr. Bruce Johnson from Australia. What a wonderful uh, session given by him. He has told us about the HOMA organic farming for a sustainable future and, it, and its effect on the quality of harvest and the quality of taste and also the nutritious value of all the products. And he also given us the comparative analysis in terms of yield from the farming with and without Agnihutra Homa therapy. Very wonderful session given by him. He's also quoted the example of Kamale Singhji from the Unnao UP, who is also able to uh, control his diabetes, even diabetes from the Homa therapy. So very wonderful session. I would also like to thank Dr. Shushil Dikshit Ji from the Canada. He has to, uh, told about the impact of food security and biodiversity on nutrition in developing world. And he has also told us uh, about the major drives for agriculture growth, such as the market access, education and training, and nutrition, etc. Next, I would like to thank our chief guest, Dr. Bimal Mohantiji from India. He has first time shown us that the fish there could also be an important component of our human diet. And he also told us that it is a source of Puma, DHA, antioxidants, and other micronutrients and vitamins. So they, it can be used as a good nutrition for us. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Jolly Rajat from the Kenya. She has told about the sacred forest from the Kaya Koma and Kaya Soko, Sokerio, sorry, Sokerio. And he has also shown us the beautiful pictures of their culture. And it is really very fascinating. Then, I would also like to thank Dr. Shyamji Shukla, although PPT is giving some problem, but he also told us about how you will manage the wheat of leguminous crop by employing the secondary metabolite of some fungi. So if you use the secondary metabolite, the side effect will be less. If you are using some pesticide, we decide. Instead, if you use the metabolites of fungi, so that would be the wonderful. Then I would also like to thank Dr. Ashni Kumar Dubeji. Without him, this would be impossible to organize this international virtual conference. There are some persons which are behind the screen. Uh, from the technical team, Mr. Mohit Kumarji and Mr. Krishna Pratapji. From social team, Mrs. Asanya Khare and Mrs. Anjali Chaurasia Ji. Dr. Santosh Kumar Morji from the Faculty of Management. Uh, Mr. Akshay, Mr. Arvind, Mr. Saket, uh, uh, Dr. Akash Singh Ji. There are many persons behind the screen. And I'm very thankful to all those who has participated and given us to uh, complete uh, this international virtual conference. Thank you so much. And over to Dr. Ashwini Kumar Deviji. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind things. And uh, once again, I would like to thank and uh, I am very happy to I say that uh, you have accepted my invitation and uh, you have shared uh, your living thought over here. Definitely, this uh, thoughts will become uh, uh, my tone of this uh, uh, rural development and uh, some other technologies. So, once again, I don't have uh, another word to say anything to you. Dr. Sushik uh, is a uh, 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 abroad, and I still thanks to Dr. Uh, Bimal Mohanthi, uh, just uh, who have connected with us by uh, uh, LinkedIn, and uh, with very short time, 
you have accept our invitation and uh, discuss <laughs> over here. Allah, jaldi se. जी हेलो ये तो बारी हो हम सब अनम्यूट कर दिए ऐसा मैडम सभी को यस सर सभी को अनम्यूट कर दीजिए यस yes, सर ऑल आर यू वांट टू वांट मी टू टेल समथिंग हेलो जी हमको कुछ बोलने के लिए बताए क्या तो हेलो यू वांट माय कमेंट्स आर समथिंग नमस्कार हेलो या सुनी जी यू वांट मी यू वांट मी टू 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 गिव माय कमेंट्स हां सर रिंगे सर हां दे दीजिए नो नो बिकॉज़ इट इज अ फोकस आई आई थॉट मे बी यू वांट सम ऑब्जर्वेशन समथिंग लाइक हां मोहंती जी बोल लीजिए आप थोड़ा कमेंट दे दीजिए कैसा लगा आपको या ठीक है सर वेरी थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड इट इज रियली एक्सीलेंट टू सी that over a period of 3 days of course i was not there in the past two days so in a short time i was invited and uh, dr ashin kumar contacted me so uh, requested that i should be there so i thought that yeah i, should, I must manage some time from my office and uh, it's a great uh, experience today because uh, they named it as a international virtual seminar and they have uh, in fact organized uh, uh, people from uh, so many countries people there from canada and uh, from australia and uh, kenya and many places and the way the our uh, friend uh, uh, dr johnson chanting the sanskrit mantras and uh, homo and all these things was describing and uh, our people should say, our people sometimes attire over it and uh, he has described and uh, not only from india australia and many other countries he has given examples so these are certain things we must uh, without uh, being sarcastic we must look into it and we see, see the scientific aspect of it and uh, our colleagues from uh, say south arabia and uh, uh, say like dr dikit from canada and uh, australia several people shared their experiences and uh, say I means it is a very topic <coughs> on different aspects people spoke and uh, you, uh, you made uh, you made tremendous efforts otherwise organizing several people from uh, all different places over the zoom platform it is not easy so your organizing capability and uh, i really appreciate and we will be happy in future any time and it gives a pleasure that uh, yeah your university could organize it over a period of 3 days and several people participated and in future also i think all our speakers will be finding time again even your in so efforts we will be definitely with you so thank you very much again our high appreciations and uh, uh, congratulations thank you thank you very much तो डॉक्टर अवित्री डॉक्टर अवित्री फ्रॉम त्रिभुवन यूनिवर्सिटी नेपाल यस यस सर थैंक यू वेरी मच आई एम एंजॉइंग द कॉन्फ्रेंस एंड आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू यू एंड ऑल द आई एम टेकिंग यू एंड ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट एंड स्पीकर्स एज माय एकेडमिक फैमिलीज I am really, really happy with you. Thank you very much, my friend. And I have your two points. Um, I, um, 
One is for the benefit for academicians to educate students, not only to educate students, but also the for it is also helpful to further researcher and second to guideline for decision makers, decision makers of the government. The government should uh, make a proper decision with our paper and um, I think we should have to submit this, submit this, this finding. We should have to submit this finding for for um, for the decision makers of the Indian government or the uh, agriculture department of India. Thank you very much. I am really very thankful. Namaste from Nepal, and I am very happy with you. All the best, and uh, hoping to get uh, another conference very soon. <laughs> and I know you will do it. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. With wish you have all the best and good wishes to each and every uh, my academic friends thank you thank you very much thank you to you too to ashuni ji hum bhi do word bolenge Thank you uh, so much uh, for organizing this excellent meeting. Uh, sorry, I wasn't able to attend the uh, first two days because the time difference and my other commitments. So the information you provided, um, the participants you brought, the, ex the experts you brought to this meeting, that's uh, really tremendous. And thank you for effort. And uh, thank you to uh, Tripathi ji um, for, uh, for leading these activities and uh, working uh, um, I, I know uh, how much effort you had to put uh, in, in, in this all, especially during these days when the people are working from home or different um, uh, situations. Um, and it's not only that um, I was able to provide some some of what I think on food security, nutrition, and biodiversity. Um, I had earlier come on uh, to talk about COVID situation, you know, what's going on and all that. And it, it gave me an opportunity to also listen from other experts and hopefully there will be opportunity to work with them, collaborate with them. Because some of the other work I do is, uh, major work I do uh, is uh, environmental quality guidelines. Uh, these are toxicity based guidelines for water quality, sediment quality, soil quality and things. And uh, I do see, you know, um, uh, some for, uh, a lot of potential to um, work with others and this is what um, we are looking uh, uh, from our side. So thank you again and uh, all the best to everyone. Bye. Uh, also, I would like to thank all of you and the organi organizing committee uh, for uh, organizing this uh, conference. It is a virtual conference, but it is very useful. We learn a lot from it. And I would not like to repeat the good words that said by uh, the other speakers, really, it is a, a nice network. It is a nice collection. They are expert. A lot of papers are uh, so promising, and uh, many, many good ideas were presented during the conference. Thanks for the organizer, for the university, for the supporting staff who are behind the scene. There are many, we know that, for the, like this organization. Even it is virtual, but it need a lot of logistic, a lot of preparation and something like this. Thank you very much. And I hope to be a network for connecting all of us. And we will meet soon in another conference or uh, any scientific gathering. Thank you very much. Dr. Kamdeke, Tamil Nadu. What? Please, uh, say few words about this uh, international conference, uh, because uh, you have uh, attended uh, three days. Uh, yeah. Sir? Sir, do you hear me? And, uh, and you give me, you give me uh, your valuable suggestions also, Dr. Uh, Kamani. Uh, sir, Dr. Kamani, from Karnataka, sir, not from, from Tamil Nadu. <laughs> uh, I am a friend of Ashwin Dubey, sir. <laughs> Uh, as I observed from the three, three days, all the speakers are worked out for the uh, good theme and also up to the mark. I hope it is reached to every corner and uh, the need of the day. Next onwards, uh, let us work for the good things. Whatever the efforts you have done was very nice. 
and it is fruitful. Thank you for one and all who have taken train for this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much to all of you. So in action, so we made again by new effect from Sri Krishnaishti Chapur Madhya Pradesh, India. Bye bye. Asuni sir. Bye bye. See you. Asuni sir. Bye. Asuni sir. Bye to everyone. Asuni sir. Hello. Sir. Sir. Please announce. Please announce for the feedback form. Sir, do you have any? If you make the national anthem, it will be good. I hope you are not planning for that. Dubey sir. Hello. Dubey sir. Dubey sir. Yes sir. Uh, if you have been ended with the national anthem, it was very very fruitful. What I think, but it is uh, not planned. But uh, if you want to complete it by your, uh, our own words, it will be fruitful. What do you say? Online program. <laughs> <laughs>